The drive to Glacier National Park in 1997 should have been a dream come true. Me, fresh out of college, itching to see something beyond the rolling green hills of my native Kentucky. My name's Wyatt, Wyatt Caldwell, and if anyone asked why I was headed to Montana alone with just a backpack and a beat-up tent, it was simple. Sometimes a man needs some wide-open space for his head. The first few days were a hiker's paradise. Trails snaked through forests thick with pine. Waterfalls tumbled from sheer cliffs. The kind of postcard views that make you believe in a higher power. Even the solitude, which I'd been craving, felt good for my soul. Maybe it was that sense of peace that made me drop my guard, take a detour off the main path. That's when I saw it. A narrow fissure in a cliff face, barely visible beneath a canopy of pine branches. It pulled at me. The promise of the unexplored. Leaving my pack propped against a tree, I ventured in. The opening was tight, forcing me to crawl on my belly, the rough rock scraping against me. I should have turned back. My dad's voice, always the cautious type, echoed in my mind. But that same stubbornness that got me into trouble as a kid propelled me forward. I squeezed into a slightly wider chamber, the stale air heavy despite a faint crack of sunlight from somewhere above. Then I stumbled on them. Bones. Not animal bones. I knew that much from my Boy Scout days. Human. Dozens of them scattered across the floor. A chill swept through me, fear prickling the back of my neck. This was no ancient burial site. Nothing about it felt... old. As if on cue, my foot kicked something hard. I looked down to see a weathered wallet half buried in the dirt. It was faded leather with a Wyoming driver's license inside. The face on the card, smiling wide under a ten-gallon hat, belonged to a man named Ethan Cole. The license was issued in 1994, just three years prior. It hit me then, a wave of nausea washing over me. This place wasn't a discovery, it was a tomb. These people weren't long-lost pioneers. They were recent. And whatever put those bones here could still be lurking nearby. Hey, anyone there? I called out, my voice echoing eerily in the cavern. No reply. I thought of Ethan Cole, the picture of the guy frozen on that plastic card. Was that his skull lying there in the dirt? Had his big, sunny smile been the last thing, whatever it was, had seen? Scrambling backwards, I hit my head hard on the rock, stars exploding in my vision. The cavern spun, the walls closing in. For a panicked second, all I could think was, this is how it ends. Stupid college kid plays explorer gets himself eaten in some nameless cave. Then something shifted in the shadows, a flicker of movement in the far corner. With a jolt of adrenaline, I scrambled to my feet, my flashlight beam cutting into the darkness. What I saw made my blood freeze. There, crouched low, was a massive figure. Humanoid, yet wrong. Its body was impossibly thin, ribs protruding through tight, leathery skin. Its head was too large, the jaw jutting out unnaturally, a mess of mangled teeth bared in what was either a snarl or a gruesome grin. But it was the eyes that chilled me to the core, vacant, inky black, glinting with a hungry intelligence. He lunged. Time seemed to stretch out, my body moving in slow motion as I stumbled back, my scream caught in my throat. He was inhumanly fast his long, clawed fingers slashing at my face. Get out of here! Stay away! I yelled, grabbing the only thing within reach. Ethan's dusty wallet. I hurled it at the creature with all my strength. It shrieked, the sound a mix of rage and surprise, momentarily distracted by the object. That bought me precious seconds. Turning, I scrambled madly for the cave entrance, my breaths coming in ragged gasps. Branches whipped at my face, the rough bark raking my skin. But I didn't stop. I burst into the blinding sunlight, gasping for air. Then, without hesitating, I ran. 
through the trees, across meadows, I ran till my lungs burned and my legs felt like they'd give out. The forest was a blur of green and brown, but I sensed him behind me, the rustle of leaves, the cracking of branches under his unnatural weight. I stumbled out onto a narrow cliffside path and froze. Below, a waterfall cascaded into a rocky chasm, the roar of the water filling my ears. It was a dead end. Behind me, the sound of his approach grew louder, closer. There were no more trees to hide behind, nowhere to run. With trembling hands, I drew the hunting knife my dad had given me, knowing deep down how useless it would be against the monster that emerged from the shadows. The creature stalked toward me, steps echoing in the sudden silence. Every inch of me screamed to fight, but a deeper animal instinct told me this was beyond fighting. This was survival, pure and unforgiving. It tilted its head, those inky eyes calculating. My heart hammered a frantic rhythm against my ribs, my breaths coming in sharp, shuddering bursts. Then it did something I hadn't expected. It paused, its gaze snagging on something behind me. For a heart-stopping moment, it almost looked confused. I whipped around, following its gaze, and almost tripped in shock. Two figures stood on the path, a young couple, wide-eyed and frozen in a mix of terror and awe. A surge of desperation washed over me. Run! I screamed. It's coming for you! Run! They didn't move. Their eyes were fixated on the creature, as if held in some macabre trance. Pure, undiluted horror rippled through me. These two... They were doomed. They were going to die because of my stupid detour, my recklessness. The creature hissed, the sound slicing through the air. It lunged, moving not for me but for them. The man tried to react, shoving the woman behind him, but he was too slow. The creature's emaciated hand snaked out, fingers like hooks closing around the man's neck. There was a sickening crack as it hauled him effortlessly toward the precipice. Suddenly, the woman shrieked, a piercing sound that snapped through my fear like a whip. It seemed to break the spell over both creature and victim. The creature paused, shifting its attention to her. The man in its grip clawed frantically at the bony fingers, gasping for air as his legs dangled over the cliff's edge. That moment of hesitation was all I needed. In three desperate strides, I was next to them, my hunting knife raised. I wasn't aiming to kill the creature. The futility of that was obvious. But I needed a distraction. A chance. Screaming a wordless battle cry, I slashed at the creature's arm with all my strength. The blade sliced through the leathery skin, but to my horror, it didn't flinch. Its empty eyes fixed on me, and for a frozen second, I knew... It had made a choice. Ignoring the struggling man, it turned its twisted grin on me. I jumped backward, barely dodging the clawed hand that reached for my throat. Without another thought, I hurled myself towards the woman. I hit her hard, sending us both tumbling away from the edge, rolling down a steep slope. Crashes echoed behind us, the sickening thud of flesh hitting rock, followed by a final fading scream. I scrambled to my feet half dragging, half carrying the woman further from the cliff edge. My heart pounded in my ears, a desperate rhythm drowning out her soft sobs. It didn't follow. For whatever reason, it had stayed by the cliff, its guttural growls echoing after us as we crashed through the underbrush, further and further into the trees. Hours later, dehydrated and scraped up, we reached a service road, flagging down a passing car. The park rangers arrived, then the police, the paramedics. I told them everything, my voice shaking, about the cave, the bones, the creature that hunted in the shadows. The woman beside me sobbed into her hands, her face a mask of traumatized shock. As expected, the search party turned up nothing at the cliff's edge. No sign of the creature, no body. The prevailing theory became that the man had been hallucinating, perhaps under the influence of something, and had tragically jumped, either alone or accidentally dragging the woman with him. 
That's what went into the official reports. A freak incident. A cautionary tale of the perils of the wilderness. I was labeled the brave hiker who helped save a victim, lauded for quick thinking. Even Ethan Cole's bones were discovered in the cave, his family finally getting closure after years of uncertainty. No amount of closure changed the truth I saw. The creature was still out there, a dark stain on the edge of a place I once saw as nature's sanctuary. I left Glacier, returning home, but the peace I craved never came. I became a man obsessed, haunted by black eyes and skeletal forms. Therapists whispered PTSD, but my nightmares were far too vivid, too disturbingly real. News trickles in occasionally, a hiker mysteriously vanishing, a body discovered torn to shreds in the remote backwoods, the cause of death forever labeled animal attack. These incidents are scattered, seemingly random, but I know better. The creature thrives in that liminal space between rumor and reality, its existence doubted by the wider world. And maybe that's what keeps the rest of you safe. Ignorance. As for me, I've traded the wilderness for urban landscapes, the anonymity of a faceless crowd. My backpack gathers dust, a reminder of the naive kid who thought exploring meant conquering. I've learned that the real monsters don't need claws or fangs. Sometimes they lurk in our blind spots hidden within the shadows we ourselves cast. They thrive because we refuse to accept that some darkness cannot be illuminated, no matter how brightly we shine our flashlights into the abyss. Some reckonings don't come with a neat ending, with answers or absolution. They simply are, a chilling whisper on the wind, a shadow that falls just a little too long. Maybe. Just maybe. It's some kind of twisted mercy that the world sees me as a bit broken. A guy who stares too long at the shadows. Because if they saw what I really saw, they might realize just how fragile the veil between the known and the unknown truly is. They might understand that some monsters are real, even if we don't dare speak their names. I always figured folks up in northern Washington were kinda off, you know? That whole backwoods cult vibe runs strong out there. Honestly, I should have known better than to accept that logging job, especially that far into the wilderness. I'm Ryan, by the way, and I swear what I'm about to tell you might sound crazy, but every word of it's the God's honest truth. First day on site, I'm getting the lay of the land from the foreman, a grizzled old bastard named Heathcote. Dude had one eye, the other hidden behind a nasty old patch, and not a single tooth in his head that I could see. Anyway, he takes me out to the furthest part of the logging area, points to this patch of massive pines and says, See those there? Don't touch them. Naturally, me being me, I ask, Why the hell not? Heathcote spits some brown gunk on the ground. Old growth. Sacred or some such nonsense. Company's got an agreement with the locals. I raise an eyebrow. Locals? We're miles from anything resembling a town. That's when he gives me the one-eyed stare, and even though the sun's beating down, I swear I feel a chill. Don't mean there ain't folks living out here, boy. Now you listen good. Them trees stay, or else... He doesn't finish. But the way his voice lowers, I get the message loud and clear. Something about this whole setup feels hinky, but hey, a job's a job, and I'm not one to argue with a paycheck. Plus, I've got a healthy dose of morbid curiosity. First few weeks, things go about as smoothly as you'd expect for logging. The work's tough, the bugs are monstrous, and the crew's a bunch of roughnecks with even rougher personalities. There's Silas, built like a bear who never stops grumbling, and twins, Finn and Bran, who barely talk but give me the creeps with their silent stares. We keep a wide berth from the sacred trees, but there's this weird energy in the air around them, like the forest itself is holding its breath. Even the birds seem to avoid that area. Me, I'm not much for superstitious crap, but you spend enough time in the woods, 
you start noticing things. The shadows seem a little deeper, the wind a little colder. Then comes the night, it all goes to hell. I'm on late shift, running equipment near the Forbidden Zone. It's close to midnight, and everyone else has turned in. Now, I ain't one to spook easy, but there's something about being alone in those woods at night that sets your nerves on edge. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves, makes you jump. I'm about to call it quits when I hear it, a low, guttural growl from the direction of the sacred pines. It's not an animal I recognize. Hell, it almost sounds... human. I freeze, heart pounding. Another growl, closer this time, and a prickling sensation crawls down my spine. Some primal part of my brain screams at me to run, but instead, like a damn fool, I switch off the machine and grab my flashlight. Bad move, Rian. Real bad move. The second I step into the shadows, the smell hits me, like rotting meat and something sickeningly sweet underneath. My stomach turns and I almost gag, but I force myself forward. The beam of my flashlight cuts through the gloom, and that's when I see it. At first, my brain refuses to process it. Standing hunched between two of the giant trees is this... thing. Tall, way taller than any man, with long, gangly limbs that end in claws. Its back is to me, covered in what looks like rough, bark-like skin, all knots and protrusions. But it's the head that sends me reeling back, twisted, elongated, with a gaping maw filled with rows of needle-sharp teeth. And antlers, massive, gnarled things pushing from its skull like some kind of demonic crown. For a terrifying moment, it seems unaware of me its head tilted to the side as if listening to something only it can hear. Then slowly it turns. I don't remember screaming, don't remember fumbling for the equipment controls, but somehow I manage to get the machine roaring to life. The creature whips around, startled, and that's my cue to get the hell out of there. Branches snap and whip against my vehicle as I tear through the undergrowth, the guttural roars echoing behind me. I don't stop until I reach camp, burst into the barracks, and start yelling like a madman. Silas and the twins look at me like I've grown a second head, but Heathcote, he just stares for a long moment, that one good eye calculating. You saw it, didn't you? He finally rasps. Saw what? Silas bellows. The hell's he talking about? Heathcote ignores him, his gaze fixed on me. The Guardian... My mouth goes dry. I knew it. I freaking knew those trees weren't off-limits for nothing. But before I can ask, before any of them can say another word, a blood-curdling shriek cuts through the night. It's coming from the woods. Heathcote's already grabbing his rifle, the rest of the crew scrambling to arm themselves. Another scream, closer this time, followed by a sound I'll never forget. The wet crunch of bone and the desperate, gurgling cries of a man cut short. Marty. Finn whispers, his face pale. Silas roars in fury, charging out the door without a second thought. The twins follow, Heathcote barking orders behind them. Me? Well, I should run. Hell, any sane person would run. But something about that unholy scream. It awakens something dark and reckless within me. Before I can fully think it through, I'm grabbing an axe from the tool shed, my heart a frantic drumbeat in my chest. I know I'm walking into a nightmare, but I can't just sit here while that... that thing tears my crewmates apart. I plunge into the night, the axe heavy in my hands, the fading screams my only guide. The forest seems to close in around me, the shadows alive with unseen horrors. My flashlight's beam barely pierces the gloom, and every rustle, every snap, sets me on edge. Up ahead, I see the flicker of flashlights and hear muffled shouts. As I draw nearer, the scene unfolds before me like some grotesque tableau. Marty's body lies twisted at the base of a tree, his chest a mangled ruin. A few yards away, Silas is locked in a desperate struggle with the creature. Its claws rake across his back, 
drawing deep, bloody gashes. And Silas can barely keep his rifle trained on it. The twins are circling, trying to get a clear shot, but the damned thing's too fast, weaving in and out of the shadows like a phantom. Heathcote's barking orders, but the crew's in disarray. That's when the creature sees me. Its head snaps in my direction, those impossible antlers silhouetted against the moonlight. For a split second we lock eyes, and I swear there's an intelligence in its gaze that chills me to the bone. It doesn't feel like an animal, not fully. It's something older, more calculating. With a snarl that sends shivers down my spine, the creature abandons Silas and lunges for me. Pure terror surges through me, and instinct takes over. I don't even think, just roar and charge, swinging the axe with every ounce of strength I've got. The creature hisses in surprise, leaping out of the way as my axe bites into thin air. This gives Silas a lifeline. He scrambles back, firing his rifle wildly. One shot hits the creature in the shoulder, making it stagger. Another grazes its leg and it howls in pain and rage. Run, Ryan, get out of here, Silas yells at me, his voice strained. But some damn stubborn part of me refuses. I see Finn on the ground, clutching his wounded arm. Bran's firing desperately, trying to cover him, but the creature is just too damn fast. With a flicker of movement impossible for its size, it's on Bran, those awful claws sinking into his side. I see red. With a feral scream, I charge again. I'm vaguely aware of Heathcote shouting something, but all I can hear is the roar of blood in my ears. I slam into the creature, sending it stumbling. It lashes out, catching me across the chest. Pain explodes like fire down my torso, but I ignore it, swinging again, again, each blow fueled by a desperate, burning anger. I don't know how long it lasts, seconds that stretch into an eternity. My axe cleaves through the creature's leathery skin, drawing spatters of black, foul-smelling blood. It screeches, stumbles, and then with a final desperate heave, I land a blow squarely on its twisted skull. There's a sickening crack, and the creature sags, falling to its knees. I raise the axe for a final, killing strike, but Heathcote is suddenly beside me, gripping my arm. Hold on, boy. He rasps, his one eye gleaming. It ain't dead yet. He points to the creature. It's twitching, the gnarled antlers drooping, but it's still breathing. Heathcote pulls a flask from his pocket and unscrews the cap. Drink up, Ryan, he orders, shoving the flask towards me. This'll make it easy. I take a swig. It burns going down, some liquor I don't recognize mixed with a bitter edge I can't place. Reluctantly, I hand the flask back to Heathcote. He steps up to the creature, which tries feebly to lift its head. With a swift, almost gentle motion, Heathcote pours the rest of the liquid down its throat. The creature convulses and then goes completely still. We stand in heavy silence, the only sounds the rasp of our own labored breathing and the fading echo of the creature's death throes. Finally, Heathcote breaks the stillness. Well, that's taken care of, he says, his voice grim. Silas spits on the ground. Damn near killed us all. Should have listened to you, Heathcote. Finn limps over, clutching his injured arm. He looks pale, but there's a fierce glint in his eyes. What the hell was that thing? he asks. Heathcote tucks the flask away. Folks around here call it the skin taker, guardian of the old ways, he says quietly. We made a deal with those old ways a long time ago. Bran croaks from where he lies, his face white with pain. Heathcote sighs. Times change. Guess those old ways were getting restless. He looks at us then, at the fallen bodies of the creature and Marty, and something heavy shadows his remaining eye. We can't keep quiet about this, police gotta know, but... He raises his voice, a commanding note replacing the weariness. Anyone asks, it was a bear attack, a big one. You hear me? We all nod, too exhausted to argue. 
Even Bran manages a week. Got it. The next few days are a blur. The authorities come, gruff men in uniforms who view the scene with a mix of skepticism and unease. Our story, sanitized and streamlined, raises more questions than answers. There are hushed conversations about animal attacks, conservation laws being broken, the normal explanations that folks cling to when reality gets too damn strange. We stick to our story, do our best to bury the true horror of that night under layers of bear attacks and tragic accidents. The logging job gets shut down, company offering some paltry compensation to shut us up. Silas grumbles about it, but the rest of us, we just want to leave this whole mess behind. I spend a week in the hospital, patched up and given enough painkillers to knock out a horse. The gashes across my chest will leave nasty scars, a permanent reminder of that night. But it's the psychological wounds that cut deeper, the nightmares vivid even in waking hours. Afterward, the crew drifts apart. Silas heads up north, the twins disappear back into the shadows from whence they came. I hear Heathcote stays, stubborn as ever, out there on the edge of the wilderness, watching and waiting. As for me, I head as far away from Washington as I can manage. Now, I work at a gas station in a dusty corner of Arizona. It ain't glamorous, but it's quiet. I still jump at sudden noises, still jolt awake in a cold sweat. But the nightmares are fading, slowly. Some nights, though, when the wind rustles the desert scrub just right, I swear I hear a guttural snarl echoing in the distance, and the hair on the back of my neck stands straight up. My name is Caleb Ross, and this happened to me on October 6, 1991. Back then, I was green, cocky. Thought I worked for some hush-hush paranormal division of the FBI. Turns out, the truth was a hell of a lot weirder Think Less X-Files, more like a tax audit with teeth. Our assignment sounded simple enough. Investigate reports of unexplained activity out in the Cascade Mountains, Washington State. Locals whispering about strange lights, mutilated cattle. You know the drill. Figure out if it's some cult, a hoax, or something else entirely. We had a four-man team. Me, the newbie. Flynn, team leader, built like an oak tree with the temperament to match. Eliza, wildlife expert. All sensible boots and skeptical frowns. And Wilson, resident tech geek. Guy could hack a satellite with a paperclip and a stick of gum, I swear. The trail led us deep into the woods, prime Bigfoot territory. Plenty of jokes were cracked about that, mostly by me, trying to lighten the tension that had settled in as we got further from civilization. It felt old out there, like the trees themselves were holding their breath. Day one was a bust. Drone sweeps, sensor checks the whole nine yards. We found zero evidence supporting the locals' claims. Eliza even gave me that disappointed but not surprised look reserved for know-it-all rookies. By nightfall, we were setting up camp. And that's when things got weird. Not weird like a blurry Bigfoot snapshot, but weird in a spine-crawling way. The quiet felt wrong. Too heavy. Too thick. It was like all those forest sounds. The rustling leaves, the chirping crickets, were abruptly cut off. I noticed Wilson fidgeting by the campfire, glancing over his shoulder. You feeling something too? I asked him. He just nodded, face tight. Flynn, ever the stoic leader, gave us both a gruff look. Nerves, he muttered. It's your first time out this deep. You'll get used to it. The night dragged on, that oppressive silence pressing down on us. I lay awake, staring at the canvas of our tent, every tiny snap of a twig making me jump. Finally, just before dawn, I heard it, a low whine, mechanical, but mixed with something uncomfortably organic. Imagine a rusty saw blade crossed with a sick animal's growl. It was getting closer, 
I fumbled for my flashlight, heart pounding. Across the clearing, Eliza sat bolt upright, her expression mirroring my own terror. Flynn moved fast. Wilson, perimeter lights, now. Wilson scrambled to obey. The lights flickered on in a harsh circle, illuminating the inky blackness beyond. They revealed nothing, but the whining was louder, closer. It seemed to be circling us. Up! We're sitting ducks out here! Flynn barked. We stumbled out of our tents, rifles ready. The air buzzed with static, raising the hair on my arms. Then I saw it. A flicker of movement above the tree line, just beyond the reach of our lights. Something huge, misshapen, catching a sliver of moonlight. Before I could get a clear look, it was gone, the chilling whine fading back into the darkness. Flynn let out a ragged breath. What the hell was that? Wilson was checking our sensors, thermal, infrared, the whole tech suite. His face was pale. Nothing, he rasped. Nothing showing. Morning came, washed out in gray, the whole world holding its breath. We searched the area, Flynn with his grim efficiency, Eliza tracking any sign, any disturbance on the forest floor. They found nothing. No footprints, no torn branches, nothing that explained the impossible thing we'd all witnessed. Wilson fiddled with his equipment, the tech equivalent of worrying a loose tooth. The readings, he muttered. I don't get it. Whatever it was, it left no trace. It's like it was never even here. Fear was gnawing at me now, that adrenaline crash leaving a shaky exhaustion in its place. I wanted to radio it in, call for backup, get the hell out of there. But Flynn's face was set. We finish the mission, he declared. And that was that. The second night we were on edge. The wine never returned, but the oppressive silence was enough to keep us awake and armed. There was a watch set up, but even Flynn looked rattled, his gruff barks edged with a new tension. It happened just after midnight. A sudden crash from the woods behind Eliza's post. She let out a yelp, flashlight beam wildly cutting into the darkness. Eliza! Flynn's voice was a harsh whisper. S something ran through. Big, fast, she sputtered back. We converged on her position flashlights swinging. It looked like a wild charge. Branches snapped, the undergrowth trampled. We followed the track as deep as we dared, but it disappeared abruptly, as if whatever made it had simply vanished. I caught Eliza's eye as we returned to the camp. We shared a silent, panicked look. Things had escalated, and fast. We'd gone from strange lights to whatever the hell had barreled through the woods. Sleep was impossible. I huddled by the embers, trying to calm my racing thoughts. I must have dozed off, because a sudden shout jolted me awake. It was Wilson. He was pointing wildly into the darkness, eyes wide with terror. We followed his gaze. And there, high above the tree line, were lights. Not a singular craft, but a cluster, bobbing gently in the night sky. They pulsed red, then orange, in a slow, unsettling rhythm. And below them, just visible through the branches, was a shape. It mirrored the movement of the lights, sinuous and sleek, impossibly long. A collective gasp went up. Flynn's grip tightened on his rifle. Open fire, he ordered. Our gunfire ripped through the night. The lights seemed to recoil, the shape below them whipping out of view. Then, nothing. The lights winked out one by one, leaving us in a darkness that felt even more menacing than before. Silence clung to the trees like a shroud. I held my breath, waiting for a response, some monstrous roar that would shatter the night. But none came. Wilson's voice broke the stillness, shaky and a little too high-pitched. The sensors, they went haywire. For a second there was a reading, massive then it was just gone, like it blinked out of existence. Flynn swore under his breath. The unshakable leader was starting to crack under the pressure. 
Regroup, he ordered. His voice held a new tremor. Back at camp, the mood was grim. No more jokes, no more pretense of a routine investigation. We huddled together, our flashlights casting a pathetic circle of light into the encroaching darkness. What now? I asked. Nobody answered. What could we do? We were outgunned, outmatched, and in way over our heads. It was Eliza, of all people, who broke the tension. The wildlife expert, the one always armed with a notebook and a skeptical frown, now had a look of hard determination on her face. Whatever we saw, whatever we're dealing with, it's not natural, she said, her usually soft voice firm. There's something otherworldly about this. The word hung in the air, a silent admission of what we all feared. It seemed absurd, the kind of thing you scoff at in bad late-night documentaries. But out here, surrounded by a darkness that pulsed with the unknown, it felt more than plausible. It felt like the only explanation. Flynn, ever the pragmatist, scoffed. Aliens now? Give me a break. But his scoff sounded weak, almost desperate. The rest of the night was an agonizing blur. We huddled together for warmth and a meager sense of safety. I barely slept, my mind racing through a hundred horror movie scenarios, each wilder than the last. Dawn came as a relief, though it held little hope. The woods, washed in that pale morning light, seemed deceptively normal. Yet the broken branches and the lingering aura of unnatural events were impossible to ignore. We broke camp with grim efficiency. Every sense screamed for us to run, but Flynn was adamant. We had a duty, a mission, and damn it, we would see it through. It was a thin argument, even to myself, but it was all we had to cling to. That final day is etched into my memory with agonizing clarity. Each rustle of leaves had me flinching, expecting some monstrosity to erupt from the trees. We came across more torn-up sections of forest, evidence of whatever had barreled through our camp two nights prior. But of the creature, or creatures themselves, there was no sign. It was almost dusk when we reached the clearing, our designated extraction point. Relief warred with a gnawing sense that it wasn't over. Flynn radioed it in, his voice clipped and tense. We waited. The minutes crawled by each loaded with unspoken dread. It wasn't a chopper that arrived to pick us up. It was a convoy of black SUVs, the kind you see in conspiracy theory documentaries. From them stepped men in crisp suits, their faces hard, their eyes hidden behind mirrored shades. No introductions, no explanations. Just the air of authority that said they were in charge now. Flynn bristled, his natural defiance rising. What the hell's going on? Who are you people? One of the suits stepped forward. That information is classified, he said smoothly, along with everything you've just witnessed. The fight went out of Flynn. We were being swept away, erased from the official record. Whatever we'd encountered was now beyond our reach. The ride back was silent. Eliza stared out the window, her face blank. Wilson fidgeted nervously, no doubt dreaming of firewalls he couldn't breach. I just felt numb. It was like a nightmare made real, the realization that the world was wilder and far more dangerous than any textbook acknowledged. We were deposited back at some nondescript government building, ushered through sterile hallways, and finally crammed into a briefing room. Another suit, this one with a higher pay grade, stood waiting, I understand this was irregular, he began, his voice dripping with practiced condescension. He launched into an explanation, a carefully worded speech that boiled down to this. What we saw didn't exist. We didn't see it, and if we knew what was good for us, we'd never speak of it again. In the weeks that followed, there were more debriefings, thinly veiled threats, and the quiet assurance that our careers, our lives, would be ruined if we slipped up. Flynn raged at first, 
then retreated into sullen silence. I quit. They offered a severance package, hush money to keep me quiet. I took it. Wilson disappeared. Whispers were that he'd gone off-grid, paranoid, and raving about things nobody should ever know. Eliza. I heard she stayed, delved deeper into the world we'd barely glimpsed. Maybe she was braver than me, or maybe she was consumed by a need for answers I no longer had the stomach to chase. The aftermath for me is a life lived in the shadows. I jump at every creaking floorboard, every flicker of movement outside my window. I dream of those pulsing lights, of the sleek, impossible thing that moved beneath them. The fear never fully fades. Sometimes, I find myself scrolling late at night, hunting for scraps of similar stories online. Conspiracy forums, blurry photos accompanied by wild, desperate claims. And a small, guilty part of me wonders, are there others like me out there? Others who witness the impossible, who carry the weight of a terrifying truth? The thought offers a strange kind of solace, because even in a world that will never believe us, it's a comfort to know we aren't alone in the dark. This happened to me on June 24, 2001. It was a humid night, the kind making the uniform cling to my skin, and you can bet it didn't help my mood any. I'm Adam Palmer, and I'm the kind of small-town cop that sees more stray dogs than actual crime in a week. It's in Jamestown, Tennessee, nestled in the Smoky Mountains. We mostly just keep tourists in line and settle squabbles between local yokels over whose goat wandered onto whose property. And yes, that actually happens. Tonight, I'm driving up Highway 127 to check in on old Mrs. Henshaw. She tends to get lonely out there in her farmhouse and calls the station in a panic about prowlers or noises about, oh, three times a week. She's a sweet lady, though. Makes the best pecan pie this side of the Mississippi. So, I go. Even though dispatch knows it's probably a false alarm as well as I do. Sometimes it's good to know someone cares a little, even if it's just old Adam the cop stopping by again. I pull off 127 and take the dirt road that leads up to Henshaw's place. It's a good half mile before the farmhouse comes into sight, a squat two-story building with peeling white paint bathed in the hazy glow of its porch light. Looks quiet as usual, but duty calls, so I park the cruiser and head up the path, kicking up a cloud of dust. Mrs. Henshaw, it's Adam. I give the door a couple of solid knocks. You home? Silence. That's odd, usually, she'd answer even if it was just a fuss, that I didn't need to come out all this way. I try the handle. It isn't locked. Okay. Now there's a flicker of worry. Mrs. Henshaw might go a little overboard with the warnings, but she wouldn't leave her house open. Pulling my flashlight from my belt, I step through the doorway and into the old house. The air hangs thick with the sweet smell of baking, but not the good kind. There's a sickly undertone to it, almost like rotting fruit. I frown and step further inside. Mrs. Henshaw? I move from room to room, the beam of my flashlight cutting through the gloom. Furniture is out of place, overturned chairs, cushions slashed open. Not robbery. There wouldn't be this kind of senseless chaos. Something else is wrong here. Real wrong. In the kitchen, it hits me full force. The oven's been left on, the sweet smell now so overpowering it's almost nauseating. A pie sits on the countertop, bubbles of liquid oozing from the crust. It's black and split and even from a few feet away, I can see those aren't blueberries bursting through. It looks more like... blisters. Then, a voice cuts through the thick silence. Adam? I whirl around, flashlight and gun raised. It came from upstairs. Mrs. Henshaw, is that you? I start towards the staircase, the uneasy feeling in my gut intensifying with every step. Please, Adam, hurry! 
Her voice comes again, weaker now, tinged with something I can't quite place. Not quite fear, not exactly sorrow. When I reach the top of the stairs, the smell is worse. It's thick, almost suffocating. My flashlight cuts through the gloom, revealing the long hallway leading to Mrs. Henshaw's room. That same sickly sweet baking smell seems to seep from under her door. Mrs. Henshaw, I place a hand on the doorknob, a sudden tremor racking my hand. It takes everything I have to push it open. The sight that greets me almost sends me reeling back. The room is barely recognizable. The walls are smeared with a brownish-red substance, almost like dried blood. Or maybe jam? No, that doesn't make sense. The bed in the center looks like it's been through a war zone. Sheets are torn to ribbons, and what's left of the mattress is a sodden mess of that same reddish-brown. And then my eyes find the source of the smell. In the middle of the room is Mrs. Henshaw, or what was once her. She's slumped, her body twisted at an unnatural angle, surrounded by that sickening red-brown jam-like substance, now pooling on the floor at her feet. Her skin. It's not skin anymore, but a puckered shell of something shiny and black, cracked and blistered like it's been roasted to bursting. And the smell. It's like sugar and decay and something I can't place. Burnt and chemical and inhuman. A strangled noise escapes my throat as I stagger back. My stomach lurches, and it's all I can do to keep back the meager contents of my dinner. That's when I see the eyes. They open in Mrs. Henshaw's cracked, burnt face, sunken and yellowed, barely recognizable as human. A raspy, wet breath escapes from the ruined thing that was her mouth, and then she speaks. Adam, help me. Her voice is little more than a whisper, like sandpaper on broken glass. Whatever did this to her, it's taken her voice too. My mind races, a jumble of panic and disgust. There's a loaded shotgun in my cruiser, and for a second, the terrible thought flashes through. Mercy killing, putting her out of this monstrous misery. But then something else flashes through my mind, an image so terrifying, so primal, that my legs move without conscious thought. I stumble back, knocking into the doorframe as I run. It's not Mrs. Henshaw anymore. Whatever is wearing her skin as a suit, it's not good. I slam the door shut behind me, fumbling for my keys in a haze of terror. I have to get out, call for backup, get some firepower, whatever. But as I turn to run back down the hallway, I slam directly into something solid, strong. It sends me tumbling to the floor, the flashlight flying from my grasp. I hear a low snarl and the reek of that burnt, sickly sweet smell washes over me. Terror fuels me as I scramble backward, hand scrabbling for my gun at my hip. But my fingers meet only empty air. I must have dropped it, lost it somehow in that horrifying bedroom. The darkness in front of me shifts. I can't make out a shape. The hallway is mostly pitch black now. But those eyes, those yellow eyes are burning into me with a terrifying intensity. Then there's a flash of movement, impossibly fast, something long and sinewy whipping out from the darkness towards me. I manage to half roll aside, but not in time. It catches me, wrapping around my bicep with a crushing force. There's a piercing, tearing sensation, and then a burst of white-hot pain shoots through my arm. I cry out, more in shock than anything else. My mind scrambles, trying to process what the hell is attached to me. It's strong, pulling me with an inhuman force back towards that doorway, towards those monstrous eyes. I flail, try to fight it with my free arm, but I'm losing ground. Then a spark of desperation flares up in my panic. It might be useless, a Hail Mary pass, but I have to try. I lunge for the light switch on the wall beside me and slam my hand against it. It flickers, and then, blessedly, the hallway is flooded with harsh fluorescent light. The yellow eyes in the darkness let out what sounds like an enraged hiss before they blink out and vanish, retreating back into the room. The thing attached to my arm gives a vicious yank, but the light stops it cold. It recoils slightly, almost like it's been burned. For a moment, 
There's just the heavy drag of it pulling against me, the pain in my arm nearly blinding. Then I get a look at what's got me. It's not a rope or a chain, but a limb. Long and impossibly thin, it's black and segmented, ending in razor-sharp claws that have dug deep into my flesh. It reminds me uncomfortably of a praying mantis foreleg, scaled up to impossible proportions. The limb twitches spasmodically, trying to pull free of the light. That gives me an idea, rash and fueled by pure terror-induced adrenaline. Using my good arm, I grab it right below where it's attached to me. The touch feels oddly slick, cold and leathery, and it sends shivers down my spine. Ignoring the pain, I start to drag myself. Hand over hand, I inch back down the hallway, pulling the thrashing limb with me towards the stairwell, where a faint glow of the setting sun cuts in through a window at the end. The creature, whatever it is, lets out a continuous, high-pitched screech that rattles my skull and sends fresh jolts of fear through me. But I can't stop now. I reach the top of the stairs and with a final heave, I hurl myself down them, dragging the thrashing limb along with me. It thumps and claws at the floor in response, its screeches echoing in the quiet house. I crash to a landing in a tangle, but then, with a sickening twist and pop that echoes through my entire body, the limb tears free from its source. I scramble back, panting and clutching my wounded arm. The dislodged limb thrashes on the floor for a few seconds, its claws scraping madly against the wood. But without its connection to the larger creature, it seems to weaken. With a final lurch, it goes still, its black shell finally, blessedly silent. I sit there for what might be seconds or minutes, the adrenaline rush finally receding, leaving me trembling and gasping for breath. My arm is a mess, the flesh torn and bleeding, but at least I'm alive and the... the thing is gone. Slowly, I rise, my legs shaking under me. I look at the severed limb and a surge of nausea nearly sends me to my knees again. I take a deep, shuddering breath and force myself to look away. I have to get out, get help. Stumbling down the remaining steps, I nearly fall over Mrs. Henshaw's ruined body. I can't save her, but I can damn well make sure her death wasn't for nothing. Making my way back outside, I stumble through the darkness towards the cruiser. The radio... I can radio for backup, SWAT team, whatever they send to deal with whatever was in that house. My fingers fumble for the keys, and then I'm inside the car, desperately fumbling for the radio receiver. But as I turn back towards Henshaw's farmhouse, a bone-chilling sight greets me. The old place isn't bathed in the soft glow of porchlight anymore. Instead, it's a stark silhouette against the twilight sky. And in the upper window, framed against the light flickering from inside, two blazing yellow eyes are looking right back at me. For a moment, time seems to freeze. Then, the window shatters outwards as a massive shape bursts through it. It lands on the roof of my cruiser with a heavy thump, the metal denting under its weight. I barely have time to scream before its clawed hand smashes through the driver's side window. Glass sprays everywhere and I'm desperately dodging and scrambling, trying to reach the gun I never found earlier. The thing's inhumanly fast. Its long, spindly limbs writhe and strike like snakes, and it screeches its horrible, high-pitched cry over the blare of the car's horn, which I've blindly mashed in my panic. I barely manage to shove the car door open and roll out onto the dirt road. My wounded arm is agony, but I ignore it, staggering to my feet. Behind me, I hear the creature rip its way free from the crumpled remains of the cruiser. I start to run, but the footsteps behind me are swift, gaining. It's going to catch me. There's nowhere to hide, nothing to fight back with. Then, cutting through the night, headlights pierce the gloom. A pickup truck screeches to a halt beside me. It's Toby, old farmer Toby who lives about a mile back down the highway. I must have looked like a ghost, because he's wide-eyed and yelling something I can't hear over the din of my own ragged breathing. Without a second thought, I scramble into his truck. 
Toby floors it, taking the dirt road at breakneck speed with me clutching the passenger door handle. We don't slow down until we reach the highway, and then he just keeps going, straight towards town. In the rearview mirror, the farmhouse grows smaller and smaller, nothing more than a dark smudge against the night. After that, it's a flurry of police, ambulances, and questions I can barely answer through my shock. I end up in the hospital for two weeks. Severe blood loss and a nasty infection nearly did me in after what that creature gave me. They never found anything at the Henshaw place. No bodies. No sign of what I saw. The official story is animal attack. Probably a bear driven mad by something. I don't argue. They wouldn't believe me and... Honestly, some days I'm not quite sure I believe myself. I never went back to being a cop. I couldn't bear the thought of putting myself in that position again. Moved away from that town, from those damned mountains entirely. I work in a hardware store now, stocking shelves and fixing leaky faucets. It's quiet, ordinary, and I like ordinary. But even now, years later, I avoid walking alone at night. Sometimes I swear I feel the prickle of those yellow eyes watching me from dark corners. That screech echoes in my nightmares sometimes, along with the smell of burnt sugar and decay. Maybe part of me stayed back there in that hallway, back with Mrs. Henshaw, on the night something monstrous decided to come out of the dark. It was 1978 and I was 26. My name is Elias, and I loved hiking as much as breathing itself. The peace, the views, the physical challenge being in nature just made sense to me. So, for my annual solo trip, I decided on Montana. Glacier National Park was on my bucket list, a sprawling expanse of rugged wilderness that screamed adventure. I pulled into the Apgar Visitor Center in my beat-up truck, grabbed my trusty map, and headed straight to the ranger station. I was looking for something off the main trails. Less crowded, more solitude. Anything in the southwestern section? I asked, tracing my finger across the map. The seasoned ranger, a grizzled older man named Bill, squinted at the map. Well, there's the Trout Lake Trail. Moderate difficulty, nice views, but, he hesitated, there have been some unusual sightings in that area. I raised an eyebrow, intrigued. What kind of sightings? Bill leaned in and lowered his voice. Folks talking about strange noises, missing hikers last summer, that sort of thing. Nothing concrete, mind you, just rumors. That sealed the deal. I thanked Bill for the info packed up the truck, and set off toward Trout Lake. I was an experienced hiker, and a little local folklore wouldn't scare me off. Besides, a part of me craved a touch of the strange, the unexplainable. The first day was peaceful, a blur of pine-scented trails and sunlight filtering through the leaves. I set up camp near the lake, a picture-perfect spot nestled among the mountains. As twilight painted the sky in streaks of violet and orange, I settled by my campfire, listening to the crackle of the flames and the distant call of a loon. Nothing like this back in the city, I chuckled to myself. Sure, a few odd rumors had swirled around this place, but out in the vastness of the park they felt like distant echoes, easily ignored. That sense of peace shattered the next morning. I was halfway through my breakfast when I heard it, a rustling from the trees, then a snapping of branches. I froze, clutching my mug. That didn't sound like any animal I knew. Squirrels made a pitter-patter, deer were more graceful. This sounded larger, heavier. A bear, maybe? My pulse quickened, but I forced myself to be calm and observant. Bears weren't uncommon, and the usual protocol was to make noise, stand your ground. Taking a deep breath, I prepared myself. And then it stepped into the clearing. It was enormous, easily eight feet tall when it stood upright. Covered in a thick, matted brown fur, 
It resembled some monstrous ape-man hybrid out of a nightmare. Its eyes were a startling yellow, slitted pupils narrowing as they fixed on me. What struck me as most unnerving was the way it moved. Not with the lumbering gait of a bear, but with a jerky, almost fluid rhythm. Its long arms swung just a bit too close to the ground, and when it opened its maw, the teeth were far too long, too sharp. My mind, trained for the predictable threats of the wild, was short-circuiting. This wasn't a bear, wolf, or even a cougar. This was something else, something ancient and wrong. Panic surged within me, primal and insistent. I scrambled to my feet, my half-eaten breakfast forgotten. For a split second it watched me, head cocked to the side as though curious. Then it lunged. The force of the impact knocked me off my feet. I landed hard on my back, the breath rushing out of me as its claws raked my chest. Burning pain radiated through my body. Instinctively, I raised an arm toward it, trying to get my bearings. My hand brushed against its coarse fur, and something heavy slammed into my forearm. I screamed. The thing hissed, its hot, rancid breath washing over my face. It reared back, preparing another strike. In desperation, I fumbled blindly with my other hand, fingers scrabbling in the dirt until they closed around something. A rock sharp, heavy. I swung wildly, connecting with a sickening thud. The creature howled, a piercing sound that echoed off the mountains. It staggered, then fell to its side, thrashing and clawing at the wounded area. Taking the opportunity, I rolled sideways, heart pounding in my ears, and staggered to my feet. Holding my injured arm close to my body, I started backing away. I didn't dare turn and run, not with that thing hurt and enraged. To my surprise, it didn't give chase. It watched me with those unnerving yellow eyes, and I swear there was something like resentment in them. As I retreated into the trees, the creature finally turned, dragging itself into the undergrowth with a low, guttural moan. I kept going until my lungs felt about to burst. I half stumbled, half crawled, my vision tunneling as adrenaline coursed through my veins. I was bleeding in shock and possibly delirious from the pain. Eventually I tripped on an exposed root and tumbled down a small embankment, scrambling to a stop amidst a tangle of ferns. I lay there panting, gasping for air, and sobbed. Not just from the terror of the attack, but from the sheer wrongness of it all. What the hell was that thing? My wounds demanded attention. Cursing myself for coming unprepared, I ripped strips from my shirt and tried to slow the bleeding. When the initial wave of panic receded, a grim determination set in. I was alive. More importantly, though battered and scared out of my mind, I was lucid. I might be out in the woods, alone and wounded, but I wasn't giving up. The sun was past its zenith when I finally stumbled back towards my campsite. I needed my pack, my first aid kit. With grim determination, I forced myself to take one ragged breath after another, to keep moving. When I reached the clearing, my blood ran cold. The campsite was a scene of utter devastation. My tent had been torn to shreds, my supplies scattered and trampled. The smell of blood, my blood, hung heavy in the air, and at the center of it all was a chilling sight, a severed hand. The scream tore its way out of my throat. It was my hand, my dominant hand, the gnarled knuckles, the calloused fingertips, gone. The world tilted, the monstrous visage of the creature blurring with the emerald pines and the sapphire sky. Then blackness swallowed me whole. I woke to a throbbing head and a world that wouldn't stop spinning. My eyes fluttered open, squinting against the harsh sunlight. It took several disorienting moments to remember where I was, to piece together the fragments of the attack and the aftermath in my battered mind. But the hand, that was undeniably real. Frantically, I scrambled to my feet, ignoring the wave of nausea that threatened to topple me. My eyes darted around the clearing, searching desperately. Relief washed over me when I saw it. My backpack lay in a crumpled heap, 
miraculously untouched. I stumbled over, rummaging frantically until I found my first aid kit. Gauze, disinfectant, painkillers, a small blessing amidst the carnage. With trembling hands, I cleaned and dressed both my chest wound and the severed stump of my wrist. The pain was excruciating. I popped a fistful of painkillers, trying to stave off the shock that was creeping back in. I had to get out of there, find help. But how? I didn't have the strength or resources to hike back to the ranger station. No, I needed another way. My gaze fell on the lake. If I could reach the shore, build a signal fire... Maybe it could be seen by a passing boat. It was a slim chance, but it was a chance. Clenching my teeth against the waves of pain, I gathered what I could salvage from the remains of my supplies. Compass, water bottle, a lighter, some granola bars shoved into a pocket. It wasn't much, but it was all I had. Hobbling down to the lakeshore, I began the agonizingly slow process of building a fire. My wounded arm was practically useless, and my body shook with exhaustion, but a cold fury ignited within me. I was not going to die out here, not to whatever that creature was, not by myself. I would survive, if only out of spite. As the hours wore on, I felt hope start to flicker. The signal fire was built, ready to be lit if I spotted any sign of help. Yet something gnawed at the back of my mind. I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone. Turning, I scanned the tree line. And I saw it, lurking just beyond the fringe of the forest. My breath hitched. It was watching me, a predator sizing up its prey. The same chilling yellow eyes filled with a hunger that seemed to pierce my very soul. Panic flooded me. I had thought my signal fire might keep it at bay, but clearly I had underestimated the creature's relentless determination. I cursed my naivete. I should have known better. Should have retreated while I could. The creature was stalking closer now, its massive form a menacing silhouette against the fading afternoon light. Desperation lent me a burst of frantic energy. I grabbed my lighter, fumbling with trembling fingers. The monster let out a chilling snarl, baring those terrible teeth. This was it. I didn't know if my fire would be enough, but I couldn't give up without a fight. With a defiant scream, I flicked the lighter. The flames flickered to life, catching on a pile of kindling. The creature paused, its yellow eyes narrowing. Perhaps even predators harbored a primal fear of fire. Still, it did not retreat only circled warily. Seizing this sliver of opportunity, I staggered back towards the shoreline, never taking my eyes off the beast. If I was lucky, the fire would buy me enough time to scramble into the water, out of easy reach. Pain racked my injured body with each step I took. The water beckoned, promising temporary safety, or perhaps even a chance at escape, if I could manage to swim with one arm. It was a desperate gamble, but it seemed a better bet than staying put as kindling for that monster. As I stumbled into the shallows, the creature made a sudden lunge. I splashed frantically, the cold water a painful shock against my wounded body. The fire on the shore crackled behind me, the heat momentarily forgotten. The creature snarled, its claws reaching into the water. I screamed and thrashed, but a powerful blow sent me tumbling head first, my injured wrist erupted in agony as I twisted in the water, trying to regain my footing. Frantically, I kicked my legs, propelling myself further from the edge of the lake, away from those gleaming yellow eyes. Then I saw it, a small wooden canoe, partially concealed at the water's edge by a cluster of reeds. It must have belonged to a fisherman, a lucky stroke of fate that might be my salvation. Summoning every ounce of remaining strength, I swam towards it. Just as I reached the canoe, another strike hit me with brutal force. My head snapped back, and the world exploded in a blinding flash of pain. Then came darkness. I was jolted awake by a harsh, insistent beeping. My mind swam with disorientation, 
the remnants of the nightmare receding as my senses gradually returned. Where was I? What had happened? Easy now, son. Just lie still, a gruff voice said. My eyelids fluttered open. I was in a hospital bed, bright fluorescent lights bathing a sterile white room. My hand, heavily bandaged, twitched reflexively, and a surge of relief washed over me. I was alive. A man in a white coat stood by my bedside, frowning slightly. You were lucky, Elias. Found you floating in the water. Quite a nasty head wound. Can you remember what happened? I recounted my story in a halting, hoarse voice. The doctor listened impassively, scribbling notes in a chart. When I described the creature, his brows furrowed. Wild animal attack? He asked skeptically. No, I insisted. Not any animal I've ever seen. It was different. Wrong. He patted my shoulder with a forced smile. Head trauma can do strange things to the mind. Don't worry, we'll take good care of you. I wanted to protest, to demand he take me seriously, but fatigue washed over me. My eyelids grew heavy, and I drifted back to sleep, the memory of those yellow eyes fading like wisps of smoke. The days blurred together in a haze of medication, visits from concerned family members, and well-meaning but dismissive explanations from the hospital staff. Concussion. Trauma-induced hallucinations. Even when I swore I had seen something inhuman in the woods, they offered only sympathetic smiles and reassurances that I was safe now. But I knew. I wasn't crazy. Something terrible lurked in the shadows of Glacier National Park. Something the civilized world wasn't prepared to acknowledge. My missing hand was a constant, aching reminder of the reality they refused to see. Eventually, I was discharged, left to navigate a world that seemed forever altered. The nightmares persisted, vivid and horrifying. The creature, with its terrifying claws and relentless hunger, stalked my sleep. I found myself jumping at shadows, the rustle of leaves sending a chill down my spine. The mountains, once a place of solace, now loomed as a menacing reminder of my encounter. Despite well-intentioned advice to move on and put it behind me, I couldn't. Something inside me refused to let the experience become just another ghost story whispered around campfires. The gnawing sense of injustice, the knowledge that the creature was still out there, drove me forward. I started devouring local folklore, tales dismissed as mere myth and superstition. I scoured the internet, searching for any accounts that mirrored my own, any hint that I wasn't alone in seeing the unseeable. Finally, in a dusty online forum devoted to cryptozoology, I found something. A fragmented tale, passed down through generations of the Blackfeet tribe, whispered of a spirit creature said to inhabit the mountains. Powerful, vengeful, a predator of those who strayed too far into its territory. The description sent chills down my spine. The locals called it the Nanotoka. My blood ran cold. Finally, I had a name for the creature that had so violently upended my life. The aftermath wasn't healing. It was a quest. I sold what remained of my old life and moved closer to the park. I would find others like me, those who had glimpsed the Nanotoka and survived. Together, Maybe we could do what official park rangers dismissed. Find proof, warn people, maybe even, with the right knowledge and preparation, stop that terrible creature before it claimed another victim. The road ahead wouldn't be easy. It would be filled with skepticism, danger, and perhaps more heartbreak. But I was no longer simply Elias, the hiker who'd ventured too far off the Mark Trail. I was something else now. I was a seeker, a hunter, walking a path forged in blood and shadowed in the unnatural light of those impossible yellow eyes. I was born on the Wind River Reservation in the late 70s, named Tatanka. Life back then, 
well, let's just say it wasn't a cakewalk. Now, you might think being a kid on the res was all running wild and shirking schoolwork, but the truth is, folks worked hard. I spent summers on my grandparents' ranch, herding cattle and mending fences, trying to keep those old bones together. Learned a thing or two about the simple life, respect for the land. 1995. I was a scrawny young buck, more interested in my beat-up Camaro and the girls at the Silver Dollar Saloon. Until one night, that is. Night that changed everything. My buddy Jared and I, bored out of our minds, decided a bit of night fishing at Shoshone Lake sounded just about right. We piled into his dad's truck, a cooler full of beer and a couple poles we probably shouldn't have borrowed. Now, Shoshone Lakes always had a sort of reputation. You know, the usual old wives' tales of strange lights and disappearances. Jared, he loved that stuff. Figured he'd scare the pants off me with some ghost story once we got out there. I don't believe in ghosts. Never have. But let me tell you, as that old truck bumped along the dirt road, the moon cutting through the trees like a spotlight, it gave me the shivers anyway. We reached the lake, the water black and glassy under the night sky. Jared starts yapping about some monster folks say lives out there. Big old fish with glowing eyes and razor teeth. I just rolled my eyes. We set up on a rocky outcrop, cast our lines. It was kind of nice. Quiet. Just the sound of crickets and the splash of a fish every now and then. We cracked open a couple of beers, told stupid jokes that were way funnier thanks to the booze. Then that's when I saw it. Over on the other side of the lake, a flicker of light like a flashlight, but bobbing around erratically. See? Jared whispers, eyes wide. I told you there was something weird out here. I squint out at the distant shore. That's probably just some drunk kids messing around, I scoff, but my voice sounds less confident than I'd like. That light was getting closer. I could make out a shape. Looked like a boat, maybe? Too small for a proper craft, though and it was zigzagging, moving too fast to be anyone fishing. I don't like this, Jared says. Me neither, I admit. Whatever it was, it had our full attention now. Then, it stopped. Seemed to be hovering right at the edge of the trees. Another flicker of light, and then, silence. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. See, on the reservation... We got stories about the trickster spirits. Old legends, sure, but stories stick with you anyway. Let's get out of here, Jared says, starting to reel in his line with shaking hands. I nod, the fishing trip suddenly forgotten. Just as we're packing up, I hear a sound, a sort of scraping, shuffling noise, coming from the trees where the light disappeared. What the hell is that? Jared whimpers. I hold up a hand, trying to focus on where the noise was coming from. My grandpa taught me a few things about tracking. It was getting closer. Come on, I hiss, grabbing our stuff and heading towards the truck. Whatever was out there, I wasn't sticking around to find out. We start walking, the crunching of leaves under our boots seeming way too loud in the stillness of the night. Then, from behind us, a howl. Not a coyote or wolf howl. Nothing I'd ever heard before. It was high-pitched, almost like a scream, and it echoed off the rocks, making my blood run cold. Run! Jared yells, breaking into a sprint. I didn't need telling twice. We tore through the undergrowth, branches whipping at our faces, fear propelling us towards the distant glow of the truck's headlights. Another howl, closer this time. Whatever it was, it was chasing us. A flashlight beam cuts through the trees ahead, Jared's dad's truck. I can see the outline of the open door. Salvation. We run harder, lungs burning, the sound of whatever lurks behind us growing louder with every step. Just as we reach the clearing, something huge bursts from the tree line. For a split second, I see it silhouetted against the moonlight. Tall, unnaturally tall, and stooped over. 
Its arms were too long, ending in wicked-looking claws. But most of all, it was the eyes. Yellow, glowing orbs that seemed to burn right through me. I let out a yell, pure terror fueling my legs as I leap into the truck cab. Jared scrambles in behind me, slamming the door shut. The creature, if that's what it was, lets out another blood-curdling howl as it reaches the edge of the clearing. But it doesn't step into the open. Go, go, go! Jared shrieks. His dad, bless that man, must have heard the commotion. The engine roars to life. Headlights cutting through the darkness. He tears out of there, tires spitting up gravel and dirt. I don't look back. I couldn't. All I can see are those glowing eyes burning into my mind. Jared sobbing in the seat beside me, mumbling something about demons and the end of days. I try to tell myself it was just a trick of the light, a big coyote with mange or something. But deep down, I know that wasn't the case. Whatever dwells by Shoshone Lake, it ain't natural. I stood knee-deep in the waters of the Okmulgee River in 1977, fly rod in hand. The Georgia heat beat down around me, but the cool water kept me refreshed. This was my peace, a place I knew like the back of my hand. My name is Elias Tallfeather, and I'm a member of the Creek Nation. Fishing wasn't just a pastime, it was about feeding my family. A good day out here was the difference between a full and an empty belly. Hey, Elias! A friendly voice cut through my solitude. I glanced up to see Thomas, my cousin, striding across the sandy bank. He had that easy, loose-limbed walk that marked our people. Thomas... You looking to steal my lucky spot? I teased, reeling in to check my bait. Nah, you old grizzly, he chuckled. I'm heading up near the bend. Heard there's a good run of catfish upstream today. You always got your ear to the ground, don't you? I shook my head, grinning. Comes with the job, brother. Thomas was a park ranger, one of the few the service had in those days. Anyway he continued, his eyes scanning the riverbank. Thought you ought to know. Been some strange things going on around here. Strange how? I focused on retying my line. Thomas was a good fellow, but he had a nose for trouble and a tendency to exaggerate. Tracks, for one. Seen some prints that don't belong to nothing I recognize. His voice lowered, and folks been whispering, saying they seen something. Something big. Something that walks on two legs but ain't a man. I looked up at him sharply. Two legs? You sure? Bears can stand upright sometimes, you know. Nah, this was different. Tall, hairy, eyes glowing in the dark, they say. He shivered. My heart gave a soft thump, but I kept my voice steady. The stories of our people were old, full of spirits and creatures both benevolent and dangerous but the modern world had little room for those sorts of tales. Sounds like a whole lot of moonshine and campfire stories to me. Thomas shrugged. Maybe so. Just figured you ought to know. You're out here alone a lot. Keep your eyes peeled and your head down. I always do, I assured him, even though a prickle of unease had settled at the back of my neck. I watched Thomas head upstream. He moved easy, like he belonged here but there was a tension to him now, a wariness. That wariness seeped into me as the day wore on. The sunlight filtering through the trees seemed less friendly. Every rustle of leaves, every splash, made me turn, rod half-raised and ready to defend myself. But there was nothing out of the ordinary. Birds sang, fish jumped, and the water lapped at the bank, just like it had every day I'd come here. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me. It was near sunset when my unease found its target. I'd been working my way along the bank, casting and waiting, a simple rhythm I'd known since childhood. I reached a bend in the river, thick with brush on one side. I rounded it slowly, the sound of the rushing water muffling any movement I made. That's when I saw it. 
Maybe twenty yards ahead, a massive shape hunkered in the shadows. It was tall, well over six feet, covered in dark, matted fur. Its head was low, its back hunched, and in the dim light, its eyes glittered a piercing yellow. The thing was gnawing savagely on something, ripping the flesh messily. A surge of fear mixed with disgust rose in me. Whatever this creature was, it was dangerous. I froze, unable to tear my gaze from the scene. In that suspended moment, I didn't feel like me, Elias the fisherman, Elias the father, Elias the rational modern man. Some ancient part of me woke, one tuned to the rhythms of predator and prey, and my body took over. I slid backward, silent as a shadow. I moved on instinct, crouching low, keeping the creature just barely in sight. It never looked up, absorbed in its gruesome meal, and for that, I was grateful. When I'd retreated far enough, I turned and ran. I didn't stop running until I burst through the tree line and into the ranger station parking lot. Thomas was there, talking with a young couple who were loading hiking gear into their truck. He spotted me immediately, his face turning from confusion to alarm. Elias, man, what? I cut him off with a gasp. Thomas, river, down by the bend, creature, big. My words tumbled out between ragged breaths. The young couple looked at me, startled. Thomas, however, paled and grabbed my arm. What did it look like? His voice was urgent. Tall, hairy, eyes. I shuddered at the memory. It was eating something. An animal, I think. He swore under his breath. The stories were true. Damn it. Thomas, what the hell is going on? I demanded, my fear now tinged with anger. He hesitated then took a deep breath. There's something out there, Elias. Something old. Some folks call it a cryptid, others a spirit. Whatever it is, it ain't right. Thomas looked at the woods behind me, his eyes clouded with worry. Look, it's getting dark. The couple here, they can give you a ride back to your truck. For now, don't come back here alone, understand? I nodded numbly. I thanked the folks who looked more than a bit unnerved by the whole scene and climbed into their pickup truck. As we drove away, I glanced back at the woods, at the river winding towards the darkening horizon. Something was lurking in those shadows, something wild and dangerous, but wild and dangerous in a way I didn't fully understand, a way that both frightened and fascinated me. When we reached my truck, I promised the couple I'd keep a lookout for their campsite while on my land. They thanked me and sped away. I watched their taillights disappear, and then the vastness of the night pressed in around me. Overhead, the stars blazed, countless and indifferent. I got into my truck, hands shaking slightly as I fumbled for the keys. Starting the engine, I swung the truck around towards home. There would be calls to make warnings to give, and a decision to face. It was clear to me that whatever was in those woods, Thomas and I would be the ones to deal with it. This was our land, and it held things most folks couldn't understand, creatures of bone and blood, of shadow and legend. As I drove, I thought of the creature I'd seen, its yellow eyes burning in the twilight. I'd felt an unsettling mix of revulsion and a strange, almost grudging respect. We both hunted, we both survived off this land, and now we were somehow bound together. I spent last weekend with my friends at a rustic cabin in the hills outside of Red Bluff, California. You know the kind of place. No cell service, a wood-burning stove as your only heat source, and complete silence at night except for the wind rustling through the dense pines. Honestly, it sounds way more idyllic than it was. The place was a bit run down, and between the creaky noises and our overactive imaginations, I spent half the nights thinking the place was haunted. My friends, bless their hearts, tried to keep things light. We roasted marshmallows, played cards, and told stories, 
but the place definitely had a spooky vibe. A few of them went on a hike after lunch on Saturday, leaving me and my friend Ishan hanging out in the musty old living room. Bored, I started flipping through one of the dusty books on the shelves. Whoa, check this out, I said to Ishan, thumbing through a faded leather-bound book. It was full of hand-drawn sketches and notes about local legends and folklore. Ooh, creepy, he said, only half interested, but I was completely hooked. One entry in particular caught my eye. It described a creature said to roam the woods nearby, a gnarled and twisted being that locals called the Snag. Legend had it that the Snag preyed on people lost in the woods. There was even a crude drawing depicting a figure with limbs like tangled roots, its face contorted in a permanent, horrifying scream. That's some nightmare fuel right there, I said to Ashan, laughing nervously. He shrugged, indifferent. We flipped through a few more pages, finding sketches of strange symbols and whispers of rituals, but ultimately decided the book was more silly than creepy. Still, I couldn't get that image of the snag out of my head. As darkness crept in, I found myself on edge, jumping at every little noise. My friends finally came back, full of energy from their hike. Guess what? There's a clearing a few miles out. We should all go tonight, suggested Alara, the most adventurous of our group. It sounded like an awful idea, a literal horror movie setup. But with the cabin's dreary atmosphere hanging over me, the thought of a campfire under the stars seemed appealing. Foolishly, I agreed. After grabbing flashlights and stuffing our pockets with snacks, we headed out. It was a chilly night, the moonlight a soft glow, and the air was crisp under the expansive sky. As we ventured farther into the woods, my earlier anxieties started to resurface. The flashlights cut through the darkness but the shadows seemed to dance and shift in unsettling ways. My eyes played tricks on me, seeing gnarled shapes and eerie faces in the tangle of branches. Then, just when I thought I was about to jump out of my skin, we reached the clearing. It was a small, grassy opening surrounded by towering trees, a peaceful oasis in the sprawling forest. Ilara pulled out her lighter and started the fire while the rest of us scattered, looking for firewood. A sense of relief washed over me and my silly fears melted away. I wandered deeper into the trees, scanning the forest floor for fallen branches. Just as I was about to give up and turn back, I saw it, a thick, twisted shape jutting out from behind a huge oak. My heart pounded in my chest, and that horrible sketch of the snag flashed across my mind. There was something so unnatural about its form like roots forced into the shape of something humanoid. It took me a few seconds to process what I was seeing. It couldn't be real, right? But then it moved, a slow, unnatural twist, and a dry, snapping sound echoed through the clearing. Frozen in terror, I stared at it, this thing that shouldn't exist. A scream pierced the air, and suddenly everyone was running towards me. Ilara was at the front, her face pale with fear. She grabbed my arm and pulled me back towards the clearing. What's wrong? What did you see? She demanded as we ran. Struggling to catch my breath, I choked out, Some... something... in the woods. They exchanged wide-eyed glances, but nobody slowed down. We sprinted towards the fire, the crackle of the flames and the smell of wood smoke offering some small comfort. Gasping for air, I huddled behind Alara. When I dared to look back into the trees, I saw nothing. The thing, whatever it was, had vanished. I recounted what I saw, my voice shaky and uncertain. I expected them to laugh, to dismiss my fears with a logical explanation. But to my surprise, they were quiet. Fear flickered in their eyes. Then Ishan spoke, his voice hushed. You saw it, didn't you? The snag. They knew. Somehow they all knew about the legend the thing I had stumbled upon just a few hours earlier. A chill ran down my spine, deeper than any cold wind could reach. We should put the fire out, get back to the cabin, Alara said, her voice barely above a whisper. 
Without another word, they started dousing the flames. There was a frantic energy to their movements, a shared understanding of the danger we were in. We plunged back into the woods, our flashlights cutting through the darkness like feeble swords against the encroaching shadows. My heart hammered against my ribs, every creak and rustle sending fresh waves of panic through me. Back at the cabin, we barricaded the door as if that flimsy piece of wood could keep us safe. Huddled together, every creak and groan of the old structure sent a shiver of terror through the group. Every shadow seemed to twist and shift, taking on monstrous shapes. We stayed up all night, nobody daring to even suggest sleep. My thoughts raced, a jumble of fear and disbelief. Had I really seen that creature? Or was my imagination, fueled by a silly story in a dusty old book, playing tricks on me? As the first fingers of dawn reached across the sky, a sense of exhausted relief settled over us. We hadn't heard or seen anything else, but the palpable fear lingered. We quickly packed our things, the once inviting cabin now feeling like a trap. As we pulled away, I turned for one last look at the woods. They stretched out before me, dark and silent. Was it all just a product of my overactive imagination? A trick of the light and shadows? Or was there something truly monstrous lurking in those trees, a creature that defied reason and reality? I didn't know for sure, and the truth is, maybe I didn't want to. My name is Evander Knox, and this happened to me on July 22nd, 2008. Back then, my biggest concern was deciding which bar to hit on Friday nights, not whatever lay in wait out there in the darkness. I was fresh out of college, working a dead-end data entry job, but with a side hustle that was about to change my life. See, I'd always been into the weird stuff. UFO sightings, ghost stories, you name it. When I discovered there were folks out there actively investigating that stuff, people calling themselves cryptozoologists? Well, I'd found my passion. I started with online communities and research, then moved to attending conferences and doing small-time fieldwork on the weekends. Imagine my surprise when a government recruiter reached out. Next thing I knew, I was part of a covert team known only as Unit 47. Our mission? Verify, contain, and if necessary, neutralize anomalous creatures. It was the kind of stuff you joked about around a campfire, not something you actually lived. My first real mission took us to Wyoming on the trail of what folks reported as a dog man, a freakishly large wolf-like creature that stalked on two legs. Local ranchers had been losing cattle, and fear gripped the region. Our team was tight-knit, Myself, the rookie, Jensen, our seasoned tracker, and Davis, ex-military and our weapons expert. Wyoming was like nothing I'd known back east. Vast plains stretched to the horizon, and the night sky blazed with a million stars. The isolation hit you, a chilling reminder of how much untamed wilderness was still out there. We spent weeks on recon, setting up cameras and scouring the hills for any sign of our target. Nights were spent under the open sky, scanning the plains with night vision. Nothing broke the monotony but the echoing howl of coyotes in the distance. I began to think it was all a bust, one of those wild goose chases that were part and parcel of our line of work. That all changed on the fourteenth night. Davis had been tracking something unusual on the thermal. A massive figure moving with uncanny speed through the ravines. We got something he said, voice low. And it's big. In minutes we were geared up and on the move, adrenaline spiking my veins. We followed the thermal signature, weaving through gullies and patches of scrub. Something about the way it moved felt wrong, unnatural. And then we found the carcass. It was half-eaten, torn open with brutal strength. My stomach lurched, this wasn't coyote work. Whatever we were dealing with was large and merciless. We spread out, flashlights cutting through the gloom. 
A growl echoed across the ravine, a low, guttural sound that made the hairs on my arms stand on end. And there it was. A monstrous silhouette perched on a ridge, illuminated by the moon. It was far bigger than any wolf I'd ever seen, closer to the size of a bear but with an elongated, powerfully built frame. Its head was wolf-like, but with an unnaturally long muzzle and eyes that glinted with a vicious intelligence. We froze in place, the night wind carrying the scent of blood and musk heavy in the air. Davis raised his rifle, but Jensen touched his arm, shaking his head. No telling what kind of firepower that thing could handle. We needed to gather intel, not start a war we couldn't win. We retreated, keeping our eyes locked on the creature until it disappeared back into the darkness. Every rustle of the wind sounded like its returning footsteps, and sleep was impossible. We radioed back to base, our clipped report filled with as much detail as we could muster. The reply came back grim. Containment protocol was now in effect. We weren't just tracking this thing anymore. We were going to bring it down. Over the next few days, we laid a trap. A fresh carcass as bait. A carefully concealed perimeter rigged with tranquilizer darts. And us hunkered down in a blind, ready to finish the job. The whole thing sat wrong with me. We weren't wildlife control. We were executioners, but orders were orders. Night fell again, thick with tension. The creature was out there. We could feel it. Every creak, every snap of a twig had us tensing in anticipation. And then the waiting was over. It materialized out of the darkness, a silent specter drawn to the scent of blood. It approached the carcass cautiously its enormous form rippling with muscle as it tested the air. Jensen whispered the signal, and the tranquilizer darts launched from their hiding places. Three darts found their mark, thudding into the creature's thick hide. For a moment, the only sound was the rasp of its breath. Then it roared, a sound of raw fury that shook the very earth beneath our feet. The creature thrashed, snarling, its eyes blazing. The drugs were slowing it down but not fast enough. It tore at the darts, its claws ripping through its own flesh in frenzied swipes. Then it lunged, not for the carcass, but for us. Chaos erupted. Davis opened fire, rifle reports echoing through the night. The creature staggered under the onslaught, but it kept coming. Jensen grabbed me, dragging me out of the blind a split second before the creature crashed through it, splintering the wood into kindling. I scrambled for cover behind a boulder as Davis continued firing. The night was a blur of adrenaline-fueled terror. Flashes of the creature's monstrous form in the moonlight, the acrid smell of gunpowder, and the echoing thunder of gunshots. I fumbled for my own pistol, firing blind bursts at the hulking shadow. Then, a blood-chilling scream cut through the chaos. Davis. I saw it in the chaos, the creature ripping into Davis, its jaws closing around his torso the sickening sound of bone snapping. Jensen was yelling, firing his weapon, trying to draw the creature's attention. I aimed and squeezed the trigger, each shot a prayer. One of my shots must have found its mark. The creature howled again, a pained roar, and whirled away from what was left of Davis. It lunged at Jensen, claws raking across his chest, knocking him to the ground. Blood splattered the rocks. I fired again and again, driven by desperate rage. The creature finally stumbled, its massive form listing awkwardly. It let out a final, shuddering growl and collapsed. Silence descended, punctuated only by Jensen's ragged breaths. I ran to him, heart hammering in my chest. He was still alive, but barely. Blood soaked the front of his shirt, his eyes glazed with pain. Davis was gone. Nothing left but a gruesome crimson stain against the rocks. Get out of here, Jensen gasped, his voice a bloody whisper. Call. Call for evac. I wanted to argue, to drag him to safety, but there was no time. The drugs wouldn't hold the creature forever. I took one last look at Jensen, memorizing a face that I knew, deep down, I wouldn't see alive again. 
Then I turned and ran. I sprinted through the night, guided only by instinct and the distant lights of our base camp. The creature's roars trailed after me, each one a death knell for the man I left behind. By the time I reached the camp, I was a sobbing, incoherent mess. Choked words spilled out. Creature, attack. Davis dot 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 Jensen dot 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 dead dot evac arrived a frantic blur of helicopters and medics. They descended on the scene I'd fled, but it was too late. All that remained was a bloodbath and the monstrous, still form of the creature. Analysis later revealed the tranquilizers in its bloodproof we'd gotten it, but at an unimaginable cost. The aftermath was the same institutional coldness we'd all come to expect. Debriefings, classified reports, offers for counseling that no one truly took. They patched me up and sent me back home, a ghost haunted by the vacant stares of fallen friends and the chilling echoes of a creature's roar. I never went back to Unit 47. Couldn't bear the thought of facing more of those things, knowing the price that would inevitably be paid. Some nights, I still dream of those Wyoming plains, the vast sky and the monstrous shadow that devoured the life I once knew. They say the government has it all under control, that they're keeping the world safe from the things lurking in the darkness. If that's true, it comes at a heavy cost. That cost is paid in the blood of people like Jensen and Davis, in the shattered lives of those who make it back. My name is Evander Knox, and I survived. But a part of me died out there on those Wyoming plains, devoured by a creature straight out of nightmares. And that... That is the true horror story those in charge will never understand. The year was 1983. My name's David Whitehorse, and that summer I was working on my uncle's ranch out in Wyoming. Beautiful country, but lonely if you're used to living on the reservation like me. Still, the money was good, and the work wasn't so different from what I was used to back home. One evening, as I was mending a fence near a patch of forest, something caught my eye. A deer stood on the edge of the trees, but it looked... wrong. Too tall, fur dark and uneven, the way a coyote's might look after a fight, and it moved in a jerky way. I whistled, thinking it might be sick, but it just stared at me. Those eyes, they were human, filled with a cold intelligence. A shiver ran down my spine. There was something unnatural about that deer. I turned away, trying to brush it off as just my imagination. When I glanced back, it was gone. Relieved, I went about my work, but a sense of unease lingered. The sun was setting, and I decided to finish the fence tomorrow. Better to walk back to the house with some daylight left. As I headed towards the main road, I heard a rustling sound. I spun around, but there was nothing there. Probably just the wind. I picked up the pace, but the rustling kept following me, just out of sight. My heart beat faster. This wasn't natural. I reached for the hunting knife my grandfather had given me. I broke into a run. I could hear the creature, whatever it was, running alongside me, hidden in the tall grass. Up ahead I saw the road and beyond that, the lights of the ranch house. My lungs burned, but I pushed myself harder. Suddenly the deer burst out of the grass. Only, it wasn't a deer anymore. It was... I don't even know how to describe it. The height of a man, but hunched over like some kind of beast. Its body was twisted, covered in patchy, mange-ridden fur. Its face. That was the worst part. It was almost human, twisted into a cruel parody, with empty, cavernous eyes and a gaping, tooth-filled mouth. A sound escaped me. Something between a scream and a sob, and the creature lunged. I threw up an arm, the knife glinting, but it was too fast. It smacked me across the ribs, the force knocking me off my feet. I landed hard, the knife flying from my hand. The creature stood over me, that horrible human-like face inches from mine. 
I could smell its breath, foul and fetid. A low growl rumbled from its throat. I thrashed against the ground trying to scramble away, but it was no use. It pinned me with one clawed hand and then raised the other. I closed my eyes, resigned to my fate. Suddenly, gunshots shattered the night. My eyes flew open. The creature jerked, its inhuman shriek echoing through the silence. I saw a flash of red as it stumbled, and a wave of something hot washed over me. David! My uncle's voice, rough with fear. He stood near the road, rifle still raised. The creature was half crouched, licking blood from its clawed hand. Its eyes fixed on my uncle, its hunger turning into cold fury. Get in the truck! He yelled, firing another shot. The creature snarled but didn't move closer. I staggered to my feet and ran towards the truck, fear lending strength to my battered body. I fumbled with the door handle, piled inside, and then we were roaring down the road, the sound of gunshots fading behind us. My uncle glanced at me, his face grim. You see it clear? He asked, his voice low. I nodded, the image of that twisted face seared into my brain. He let out a long breath. Skinwalker, he said, the word heavy with the weight of old knowledge. They've always been around. Most folks keep to themselves, but some, some go bad. You were lucky. We arrived back at the ranch house and called the sheriff. He found the deer carcass, what was left of it, out near the forest. My cuts and bruises were blamed on an unlucky encounter with a bear or a mountain lion, the official story covering up a truth too frightening for most folks to understand. I spent that night staring at the shadowed corners of my room. My uncle sat downstairs with his rifle across his lap, keeping silent vigil. I never went back to the forest after that. The ranch still needed tending, of course, but I found ways to avoid that patch of land. My uncle never spoke of the skinwalker again, but the memory of it burned, a shadow always at the edge of my awareness. Nights were the worst. I'd dream of that twisted, hungry face, wake up in a cold sweat, heart pounding. Weeks turned into months, and slowly, the wound began to heal, if not fully scar over. My uncle insisted I go back to college that fall, and I eventually agreed. Maybe a change of scenery was what I needed. I told myself I was being stupid, that nightmares weren't real. One rainy November evening, I was walking back to my dorm room. The campus was mostly deserted. Students hunkered down in the library or grabbing late dinners. I took a shortcut, a deserted path cut between two buildings, dimly lit under flickering lamps. A rustling sound made me pause. My pulse quickened. Just the wind, I told myself. Just squirrels digging up acorns. But that night in the woods had taught me a chilling lesson. Sometimes, your instincts scream warnings your mind refuses to hear. The rustling intensified, and my heart hammered in my chest. I reached under my jacket, fingers clutching the handle of my hunting knife, now a constant companion. Come out, I called. My voice sounded small and scared even to my own ears. Silence answered, and then the sound of something wet and sticky being ripped apart. I swallowed hard. Whatever was out there, it was eating something. And if it was hungry, I took a slow step backwards, then another. Another wet, tearing sound echoed in the darkness. I broke into a run, no longer caring about hiding. I heard a growl then, inhuman and guttural. The sound spurred me on. I burst out from between the buildings, my breath ragged. I froze. Standing in the pool of light cast by a nearby street lamp was a figure. Human-shaped at first glance, but hunched, the posture all wrong. As my eyes adjusted, I saw the thin, emaciated body, the glint of teeth in a too wide mouth, the eyes, those empty, terrible eyes. It stared at me with a chilling intensity, then raised a clawed hand. On the ground beside it was the body of a cat, its stomach ripped open. I choked back a scream of horror. It tilted its head, almost curious, 
and the motion was so eerily human it sent shivers down my spine. Then, it dropped to all fours, its body contorting, transforming. In seconds, where a starving, sick man had stood, there prowled a huge wolf, its fur oily and dark in the wet light. I stumbled back, tripped, and landed hard on the ground. The wolf lowered its head, and I saw its teeth. Those teeth that had been tearing into the cat mere moments before were now fixated on me. A whimper escaped me. I was going to die here, in this deserted corner of the campus, just like that deer. A shout rang out, followed by a loud crack. The wolf jerked, snarling. Headlights cut through the drizzle, and a car screeched to a halt nearby. Someone leaped out, a woman yelling, waving a flashlight wildly at the creature. The wolf hesitated, staring at the light, then backed away with a low growl. Still fixated on me, it stalked away, disappearing into the shadows. Students spilled out of the car. Someone knelt beside me, asking if I was okay, but I couldn't focus. I kept seeing those eyes, a chilling mix of animal instinct and twisted human intelligence. The woman who had yelled stood a short distance away, breathing hard. She looked oddly familiar, and then I realized. Sarah? I croaked. It was Sarah Littlefield, a girl from back home, a year older than me. She turned, her eyes widening with recognition. David, what happened? The words spilled out then, the story of the skinwalker, the fear that had plagued me for months. The other students stared, some skeptical, some wide-eyed with horror. Sarah just nodded slowly. I know, she said quietly. There's... There's things out there that people don't understand. I never learned who or what the creature on the campus was. They called it a wolf, a rabid coyote, wrote it off as a mass hallucination. But I and Sarah knew the truth. I don't have nightmares as often anymore. Still, every time I walk down a lonely path at night, I remember the hunger in those eyes the way that skinwalker had worn a man's face like a mask. And I wonder, was it pure chance I survived that night in Wyoming? Random luck that my uncle saved me? Or was there something in my blood, some connection passed down from my ancestors, that marked me, protected me? Maybe some of the old stories have more truth to them than we realize. And maybe the reason the creatures walk in the shadows disguised as animals or twisted ravaged humans, is because they know there are still some of us who remember the old stories, who remember how to fight back. It's May, and I'm headed to Yosemite National Park. Always been a dream of mine. My wife, Anya, she doesn't like camping much, so I'm rolling solo. My name's Elston, by the way. Got myself a sweet little RV, the works. Shower, kitchen, whole deal. Just the way I like it, you know? Independent, out in the wild. Been driving for days now, and I finally hit those towering sequoias. It's breathtaking, man. That crisp mountain air, the scent of pine. I park at one of the upper campgrounds, a bit more isolated than those down in the valley. Perfect. I want the real deal. Not some tourist trap with screaming kids. First day is pure bliss. I hike some lower trails, take it easy, just soak in those massive trees. I cook up a storm on my camp stove that evening, feeling like a modern-day mountain man. Turn in early, and I'm out like a light. Next morning, I'm up with the sun, ready for a big one. The upper Yosemite Falls Trail. It's long, steep, but man, those views are supposed to be killer. I pack a bag, extra water, the usual hiking gear, hit the trailhead, and I'm one of the first out. That alone time on the trail, it's the best. Few hours in, I pass some folks heading back down. They warn me about a bear sighting further up. Figures, I think. You're always told to be cautious. I make some noise, clap my hands a bit, 
and keep on pushing. The views, they don't disappoint. You get up high, the valley opens up like this massive painting. I'm snapping pictures like crazy. I pull over on this rocky outcrop, perfect for lunch with that kind of view. That's when I see it. Up the trail, just past a bend, there's this flash of movement. Not an animal, for sure. Too tall, too... deliberate. I hold my breath, straining to see better. Heart starting to pound a bit. There it is again. Definitely a person. A man. Just kind of standing there. Watching. Not moving towards me. Just watching. Something about him feels off. City clothes, for one thing. You don't see tailored pants and a dress shirt out on Yosemite trails. And something about the stillness, the way he's holding himself. I get goosebumps. Now I'm not the jumpy type. But out here, alone, your mind starts to play tricks on you. I yell out, Hey! You lost? Just want to break that weird tension. The man doesn't flinch. Not a sound. My lunch is losing its appeal fast. I pack up. Keep him in my peripheral vision as I make my way back down the trail. Every rustle, every snap of a twig, I swear it's him, following. The whole way back I keep glancing over my shoulder. He's not there. Not that I can see, but the unease sticks with me. By the time I'm at my campsite, I'm shaken. That night's a rough one. Every creaking branch outside my RV is him, lurking in the shadows. I toss and turn, barely get a wink. Next morning, I'm on edge. But hey, paid for the campsite, and I'm determined to make the most of this trip. I tell myself, probably just some weird hiker dude got lost. Still, I stick to the more popular trails, ones crowded with families and tour groups. Safety in numbers, right? The weirdness just escalates. Later that day, I'm out taking sunset photos when I swear I catch movement in my mirrors. I whip around. A figure ducks behind one of those massive sequoias. I call out, run over, but nothing. Nobody there. Maybe I'm seeing things, the stress getting to me. That night I hear the footsteps, slow, crunching, methodical. They circle my RV. My blood runs cold. I grab my flashlight, throw open the door, and shine it into the darkness. Of course, there's nothing there. The next morning, I can't take it anymore. I break camp in record time. I don't care about the amazing hikes I still had planned. I'm not sleeping another night here with him out there. Whatever he is, stalker, creep, escaped convict, I don't know. I don't want to find out. As I'm driving down the mountain, I pass a ranger station. I debate stopping, telling them about, about whatever the hell that was. But how do you explain it? The figure in the trees, the footsteps that vanish, they'll think I'm crazy, or worse, that I'm messing around. I hit the road and don't look back. I'm miles away when my phone buzzes. It's Anya. Hey babe, you okay? Tried calling a few times, no signal? I gripped the steering wheel. Uh, yeah, had to cut the trip short. Cell service was garbage. Got a bit spooked out there, you know? She's quiet for a moment. Want to talk about it? I open my mouth, but the words catch. Instead, I say, Nah, it was silly. No big deal. I'm almost back now. See you soon. I pull off the highway, needing some air. As I walk, I replay the last few days in my head. There's a missing piece. Some detail my mind won't let me see, like a blurred spot in a photograph. It nags at me. I look up, scanning the tree line. That same tightness returns to my chest. I'm not crazy. He was real. He was out there. And there's a chance he's still out there. Worse, maybe he followed me. My eyes dart to the rearview mirror every few seconds, scanning for any sign of a car on my tail. Weeks go by and I try to shake it off. Just some weirdo in the woods, playing some twisted game but the gnawing feeling in my gut doesn't fade. I install security cameras at my house. 
I take different routes to work. I can't look at a stand of trees without getting flashbacks. Anya notices. She worries, even when I try to play it off like nothing. Then, one day, a package arrives. No return address. Just my name. My heart drops as I rip it open. Inside is a single Polaroid photo. It's my RV, parked at my campsite in Yosemite. And there, in the background, a blur in the tree line. It's him, the man in the tailored clothes, watching. Anya's right there when I open it. I don't try to hide anything anymore. She gasps, puts her hand over her mouth. I just stare at the photo, speechless. The proof is in my shaking hands. We have to go to the police, she says, her voice firm. We do. Laying it all out for the officers is humiliating. They're patient, but skeptical. I know how it sounds. A shadowy figure, some grainy photo. But they humor me, take a statement, promise to look into it. I know that's cop speak for don't hold your breath. We head home that night under a heavy cloud. Nothing will come of the police report. He's a ghost, just like I first thought. Out there, somewhere. Days turn into weeks. The tension hangs thick in our household. I jump at every shadow, every creak of the house at night. Anya, she tries her best to keep things normal, cheerful. But I see the worry in her eyes. She sleeps with a kitchen knife under the pillow, for God's sake. Then one morning, a news story breaks nationwide. A missing hiker. Last seen in Yosemite. The photo they flash. It's that same goddamn tailored shirt. Those dress pants. Same build as the figure that haunted me. Suddenly, things aren't in my head anymore. The police are all over our place within the hour. The photo I have is evidence now. Proof I wasn't crazy. They turn up reports of other missing hikers. Disappearances stretching back years. It's him. Has to be. He becomes a media sensation. The Yosemite stalker, they call him. Overnight, I'm the guy who got away, the one who lived to tell the tale. They have me on the local evening news recounting everything, the photo I'd received held up for the cameras. We go into protective custody for a while, moved around to some safe houses. The cops seem hopeful they'll catch him, use me as bait maybe. But I know better. He's too calculated, too careful. If he wanted me dead, I'd be dead. This is something else. A game of cat and mouse only he knows the rules to. A year passes. Then another. The investigation goes cold. The media frenzy dies down. Life returns to a twisted sense of normalcy. I still scan crowds. Certain I'll see that face again. Anya, she never really recovers. The fear lingers even if she tries to hide it. The spark in our relationship, it's dimmed. Every so often, a new missing person case pops up near Yosemite. The pattern fits. They never find the bodies. I wonder how many more are out there, lost in those woods. Wonder how many times he's watched someone, picked his next target. Wonder if he's watching me now. I moved to Boulder Creek, California a long time ago, in the Santa Cruz Mountains. There were lots of redwoods here, and I loved spending time in nature. My name's Eldon. I lived with my friend Narek and his little brother Zora. We'd gone to college together, and Narek had been nice enough to let me crash with them while I found my feet in a new town. It was supposed to be temporary. One afternoon we were in a rush, trying to get a hiking trip in before the sun went down. The Santa Cruz Mountains were no joke. These trails could get rough, so you always wanted extra daylight. We'd picked the Saratoga Gap Trail because it was relatively close, but we ended up taking a wrong turn early on. Didn't think much of it at the time. Just figured we'd make it a longer loop and find our way back eventually. As we pushed deeper into the mountain range, the woods started feeling different. The trees didn't look as tall as they had earlier. The air felt strange to me, 
kind of heavy, and the hairs on my arms started to stand up. Zora was usually the most talkative of us, rattling on about who knows what, but even he fell silent as we went. Something about the silence felt off. There were no birds, no bugs, nothing. Then we reached a clearing, and there it was. The first detail I noticed was the smell. It hit us like a wave, rotting meat mixed with something oily and burnt. Then I saw its shape and couldn't unsee it. At the center of the clearing was a huge... nest. Made of branches and dead stuff, a pile of debris. But it also looked like it was growing out of the ground. Like there was something living underneath, pushing it up and out. Right in the middle of this twisted nest stood a creature. I've never seen anything like it. It looked humanish, but stretched and wrong, kind of like those deep-sea fish that get warped from the pressure. No hair, just sickly pale skin pulled tight over muscle and bone. Its mouth was too big, full of sharp teeth like needles. The damn thing turned and looked right at us. We froze. Every part of me was screaming at me to run, but it was like something had clamped down on my brain. The creature didn't make a sound, just tilted its head like it was trying to figure us out. That seemed to be enough to snap Zora out of it. He yelled, Run! We bolted. It was pure survival instinct. We didn't look back, just charged down the trail like it was on fire. We could hear the rustling and snapping as it chased after us. I tripped, rolled, and smashed my knee hard on a rock. Narek dragged me up. I don't remember if he even said anything. We were both grunting and trying to breathe. We kept running, the trail getting fainter and fainter. The noise behind us was getting closer. I glanced over my shoulder and saw the pale figure break through the trees. It was gaining on us. I stumbled again, pure exhaustion taking over. Narek and Zora could have kept going, left me behind. Maybe it would have been distracted enough for them to escape. But they didn't. Keep going. I'll hold it off. Narek yelled. There was no time to argue. He turned and faced the creature, his arms going up like a boxer ready for a fight. I kept moving, Zora pulling me along. I couldn't even bring myself to look back. We ran blind, crashing through the woods. By some twisted miracle, we found the trail again. We sprinted down it, lungs burning, legs ready to give out at any second. We were gonna make it. I could almost see the main road, hear the cars, safety waiting for us. Then, it was dead quiet. Zora and I skidded to a halt. No sound, no movement behind us. We stood there panting, trying to catch our breath. Had we outrun it? Was it gone? Just when I started to think we might be in the clear, I heard it. But not from behind us, from up in the trees to the side. A snapping sound and a high-pitched screech that almost ripped through my head. The last thing I saw was a flash of pale flesh and those needle teeth lunging towards Zora. My mind went numb. It couldn't process what was happening, only that I was standing there, alone and useless, while the creature, that thing, took Zora. All at once, the shock wore off and I started yelling, incoherent screaming. I charged after them, not even caring what happened to me. I had to get him back. He was just a kid, my friend's little brother. Just as I reached the edge of the trees, I saw Narek. He was lying on the ground, still as stone, and the thing was crouched over him. It was tearing at him, ripping and biting as Narek's thrashing grew weaker and weaker. I kept yelling, but it was futile. My legs wouldn't carry me any further. The world blurred. All I could feel was this burning hatred and a desperation that made my stomach clench. Then I saw it, Narek's hunting knife lying in the dust a few feet away. Driven by a rage I didn't know I had, I lunged forward. The thing was completely focused on its meal, ignoring my pathetic charge. I snatched the knife up, screaming like I'd gone insane, and stabbed it in the back. Maybe it was just shock, or maybe my blade caught something vital, but the creature let out a piercing shriek. It whipped around, 
knocking me to the ground and sending the knife skittering away. I scrambled back, ready for it to finish me off, but there was a strange gurgle in its throat and it stumbled backward. I was on my feet in an instant, grabbing rocks and smashing them into its head. The creature staggered, and something changed in its eyes. It wasn't the cold, predatory look it had before. There was fear and confusion in it. Maybe that hesitation was all it took. I picked up the knife and lunged forward again. This time, I struck true. The creature howled and then fell silent. I didn't stop until its form was completely still, and even then I kept going, driven by some sick sort of vengeance. There was blood everywhere. Mine. The creature's and Zora's. When I finally collapsed, my body felt like it was on fire. I couldn't make out shapes anymore, just blurry colors and pain radiating from every corner of me. The last thing I heard before everything went numb was the sound of sirens in the distance. I don't know how long I drifted in that in-between state. Sometimes I would hear the faint sounds of hospital monitors and hushed voices. Then there would be screams and the smell of rotting meat. The paramedics found me barely alive on the trail. They never found Zora, and Narek didn't make it through the night. They told me the official story was something about a mountain lion attack. That's easier than admitting they don't know what happened. That there's something out there no one understands. No one's prepared for. The doctors patched me up and signed my release papers. Said the nightmares and constant feeling of something watching me were just PTSD. It was a polite way of saying it was all in my head. But I know what I saw, and I know it's not over. Whatever that thing was, maybe it wasn't alone. Maybe they're more intelligent than anyone knows. I started carrying Narek's knife again. Sometimes the only way to fight monsters is to become a little monstrous yourself. The locals call it the Skinwalker of Saratoga. My name is Rowan Carter, and this happened to me on October 12, 1997. I was a park ranger back then, fresh out of the academy, posted to Olympic National Forest in Washington State. Bigfoot country if you believe the stories, but I always figured those sightings were more likely fueled by bad moonshine than actual monsters. Turns out, I was about to be proven dead wrong. Before all hell broke loose, it was honestly the perfect job. Hiking, patrolling the backcountry, the kind of peace and quiet a city boy like me didn't even know existed. My partner, old-timer named Granger, was the stereotypical gruff mountain man, but had a heart of gold under the prickly exterior. We got the call about the missing campers on a Tuesday. Group of college kids, dumb, reckless, and ill-prepared ventured off trail and hadn't been heard from since. Routine stuff, sadly. Probably got turned around, maybe a twisted ankle. We'd find them in a day or two, cold and sheepish. That's what I told myself anyway. We started our search in the general area of their last known coordinates. Olympic is massive, old-growth forest, so dense the sunlight barely filters through. Gives the whole place an eerie primeval feel, especially as the afternoon shadows started to lengthen. That's when we found the first traces of them. A shredded backpack, scraps of torn clothing snagged on a branch, streaks of dried blood on the leaves. Granger swore under his breath, his face grim. That ain't no bear attack, he muttered. My stomach did a slow, sickening flip. Something about the scene felt... wrong, unnatural. The blood spatters were too high, the torn fabric had puncture marks I couldn't explain. And everywhere, that smell, coppery and rotten, clinging to the air. We followed the trail, if you could call it that. It was like something big and clumsy had thrashed through the underbrush, leaving a path of trampled ferns and snapped branches. As the sun began to dip below the tree line, Granger called a halt, insisted we make camp and continue in the morning. I didn't argue. The forest had eyes on it by then. An oppressive feeling of being watched, hunted. Sleep was fitful. 
my dreams filled with rustling noises and the gleam of unseen eyes in the darkness. Dawn came as a relief. We packed up quickly, rifles loaded, nerves taut as bowstrings. The trail grew fresher broken saplings, deep gouges in the earth, and more blood. And then we found the clearing, or what used to be a clearing. Now it was a slaughterhouse. Three tents lay in tatters, their contents strewn about like a morbid scavenger hunt. Sleeping bags were ripped open, their stuffing hanging from the trees streaked with crimson. And in the center of it all, the bodies. What was left of them, at least. Two of the campers, a guy and a girl, were barely recognizable. Parts were missing, limbs torn away with grotesque violence. The third body, another girl, was hanging upside down from a tree branch, her throat ripped open. I vomited, the meager contents of my breakfast burning my throat. Granger just stood there, his face like granite. Then he raised his rifle and walked deeper into the clearing, following a fresh set of inhumanely large footprints. I hesitated, my instincts screaming at me to run, but some twisted sense of duty compelled me to follow. We stalked our quarry for what felt like hours. The forest floor was a mess of crushed vegetation and those massive footprints. The smell of blood and rot grew stronger with each step. And then we saw it. It was standing on the edge of a ravine, its back to us. Even hunched slightly, it dwarfed Granger, who was a solid six foot two. Its skin was leathery gray stretched tight over bulging muscles. The head was long and narrow, and when it turned to look over its shoulder, I saw the eyes. Black, empty pits reflecting the dull light. A chill went through me that had nothing to do with the mountain air. This wasn't some undiscovered ape species. This was something older, elemental, a piece of the nightmare world bleeding into our own. Granger raised his rifle, took aim, I was too stunned to move, even as I realized the sheer stupidity of what he was about to do. One shot against that… thing… it was suicide. He squeezed the trigger. The rifle barked, echoing through the trees. The creature jolted, let out a roar that shook the leaves from the branches. Black blood spattered where the bullet had hit, and it whirled, its speed blurring. Granger got off one more shot before the creature was on him. It swatted aside his rifle like a toy, then its claws raked across Granger's chest, flinging him backward. He landed in a tangle of limbs, his scream echoing in the sudden silence. Time seemed to slow. Instinct, that primal urge for survival, took over. I raised my own rifle, a desperate, foolish gesture. The creature stalked toward Granger who thrashed weakly on the ground, his shirt a spreading stain of red. I fired, emptying the magazine in a frenzy of noise and fear. The creature flinched with each hit, its roar morphing into something like a pained snarl. Thick black blood splattered the ground, but it didn't fall. It turned toward me, its empty eyes locking onto mine. I knew then, with absolute certainty, that I was next. Blindly I fumbled for a reload. My hands shook, the spare magazines clattering against the damp earth. The creature stalked closer, a predator savoring its cornered prey. Granger let out a strangled cry, the sound abruptly cutting off with a sickening wet gurgle. His body lay still, twisted at a grotesque angle. My trembling fingers finally found a fresh magazine. I slammed it home, racking the bolt. The creature was mere yards away now, its stench overwhelming. I raised my rifle aimed for the center of its massive chest, and squeezed the trigger. Nothing. Click. Empty chamber. Terror washed over me, an icy wave that left me paralyzed. The creature roared, a triumphant, bloodthirsty sound. It lunged, then something slammed into its side with the force of a freight train. The creature staggered, its momentum carrying it crashing into a massive redwood. The impact shook the whole forest floor. It scrambled to its feet, a confused snarl rumbling in its throat. I blinked, disoriented. A truck, military issue, 
painted in dull camouflage, had appeared out of nowhere, partially concealed by the thick underbrush. Its side door hung open, and a man leaned out, a weapon in his hands that looked like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. He fired. Not bullets, but some kind of crackling energy beam that struck the creature in the chest. It howled and blistering smoke curled where the beam made contact. The creature thrashed, swatting at the air like it was fighting an unseen enemy. The man fired again, and again. The creature stumbled, its movements slowing. Then, with a final tortured roar, it collapsed to the ground, its massive form trembling, then going still. Silence descended, broken only by the rasp of my own breathing. The man jumped out of the truck, two more figures following close behind. They moved with a practiced, efficient sort of urgency, securing the area with practiced ease. One of them, a woman with steely eyes, approached me. Rowan Carter? she asked, her voice crisp and authoritative. I nodded, unable to form words. We need you to come with us, she said. There was no question in her tone. They brought us to a nondescript compound deep in the woods, Granger's body strapped to a gurney, my own wounds hastily bandaged. The place thrummed with a subdued energy, armed personnel moving in and out of bunker-like buildings. The debriefing was a blur. I stumbled through my account, my voice raw. They asked about the creature, its appearance, its behavior. I described what I saw, the questions blurring together until my head pounded with exhaustion. We've been tracking that thing for months, someone said, an edge of frustration in his voice. Lost good people to it. Another person, older, with a gaze that seemed to bore right through me, spoke then. You did well, Carter. Survived an encounter most don't. There was something like grim admiration in his voice. They offered explanations, or half-truths at least. Cryptids weren't myths, they said. Remnants of a wilder time. Creatures that slipped through the cracks of mainstream science. The government knew, had a task force dedicated to containing them. I was a recruit now, whether I liked it or not. Granger didn't make it. Death Certificate listed a wild animal attack to keep his family from agonizing over the gruesome truth. I went to the funeral, stood in the crisp fall air, and lied about the bear that took my friend. In the weeks that followed, they patched me up and put me through the ringer. Drills, tactical training, weapons I'd never imagined. Each night, I closed my eyes and saw the creature, Granger's lifeless stare, the smell of blood and rot clinging to my skin. Part of me wanted to run, to find some semblance of a normal life. But another part, a cold and vengeful part, craved the chance to hunt those that lurk in the shadows, to make damn sure that what happened in that forest never happened again. The day came when they loaded me back into a truck, a new team at my side. Different mission, different creature. Same terror lurking deep in the pit of my stomach. They handed me a rifle, the weight of it both familiar and impossibly foreign. Welcome to the front lines, Carter, someone said, his mouth stretching into a smile that didn't reach his eyes. I didn't smile back. Out there, somewhere in the vast wilderness, the monsters waited, and whether I was ready or not, the hunt was on. This happened to me on July 4th, 1996, Independence Day, a day for BBQs and parades, not whatever the hell I was about to walk into. I'm Officer Ben Hayes with the Elkin County Sheriff's Department. Small town life in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, North Carolina, is usually quiet, which is exactly how I like it. Married, two young kids, I have a lot riding on a peaceful existence. The call came in around noon. Old Mrs. Watkins, known for her rambling stories and a touch of senility, was in full-blown hysterics. Between sobs, she managed to blurt out something about a beast in the woods ate Tommy. 
Tommy was her neighbor, Tommy Parker. I sighed. This sounded like a missing pet at best. Still, duty called. I loaded up the cruiser, figuring I'd swing by, calm Mrs. Watkins down, and get back to enjoying my burger at the station's picnic. Mrs. Watkins' place is a good twenty-minute drive outside of town, the road winding into dense woods that press right up against her sprawling backyard. I pull up the gravel drive and immediately sense something's off. No barking dog, usually yapping its head off at strangers. The back door stands wide open, a basket of laundry overturned on the porch. Mrs. Watkins? I call out cautiously, gun drawn. Silence. Dread coils in my gut as I approach slowly, weapon at the ready. The inside of the house is eerily untouched. Half-made sandwiches sit on the kitchen counter, the TV still murmuring a soap opera. Mrs. Watkins isn't anywhere to be found. Then I spot a thin trail of blood leading from the kitchen toward the backwoods. That's when I know I'm not dealing with a lost animal situation. Behind Mrs. Watkins' house, the forest looms, dark and dense. My instincts scream at me to walk away, call for backup, anything but go into those woods alone. But that image of Tommy Parker, a friendly guy who always waves when I drive by, flashes in my mind. I can't just leave him. I radio for backup, mentioning a possible Code 10, 78, then step resolutely into the trees. Instantly the forest swallows me whole. Birdsong cuts off abruptly, replaced by an oppressive silence. Sweat prickles my skin despite the cool shade. The blood trail leads deeper into the woods, the crimson spatters stark against the leaf-covered ground. My heart thuds a frantic rhythm in my chest, and I'm acutely aware of being alone, terribly vulnerable. Up ahead, I see movement, a flicker of darkness between the thick trunks of ancient oaks. Tommy, I call, though the name sticks in my throat. I move with forced calm, trying to ignore the primal fear that claws at me. And that's when I see it. At first, it's just a shape, massive and hunched, lurking amongst the shadows. It moves with impossible speed, circling me like a predator circles its prey. I glimpse patches of coarse, dark fur, muscle rippling beneath. My hands, slick with sweat, tighten on my gun. Then it steps into a sliver of stray sunlight, and I get a proper look at the monstrous thing in front of me. It stands at least seven feet tall, its form both vaguely canine and utterly wrong. Claws, long and curved, glint dangerously at the end of thick, powerful limbs. Its muzzle is drawn out, a jaw filled with far too many teeth, stained with fresh blood. The eyes, they're the worst part. Burning yellow orbs filled with predatory cunning lock onto me. Fear jolts through me, a pure, cold terror that overrides any shred of training. Get back! I shout, my voice cracking. My finger squeezes the trigger, desperate to make the unnatural thing before me go away. It snarls, a guttural, monstrous sound that echoes through the trees. Then it lunges. I fire again, the gunshots deafening in the enclosed space. It flinches but keeps coming. Then the ground beneath my feet seems to explode, leaves and dirt flying everywhere as a massive furry body slams into me. Pain shoots through me as claws rake across my chest. The gun flies from my hands, lost somewhere in the underbrush. I'm on my back, the full weight of the creature pinning me down. Hot breath, reeking of rotten meat, washes over my face. This is how it ends, I think, a flicker of despair cutting through the terror. I close my eyes, bracing myself for... Suddenly, a shrill whistle cuts through the air. The beast snarls the pressure on my chest lessening slightly. I scramble backwards, eyes wide, heart pounding with frantic hope. A figure steps out from between the trees, a rifle glinting in his hands. It's Walker, another deputy from my department. He arrived far sooner than I would have thought possible. Get out of there, Hayes! Walker yells, his face pale. He raises the rifle, firing at the creature. 
It snarls, turning its fury towards him. For a moment, I'm forgotten. Using that precious window, I scramble back to my feet, my torn uniform snagging on branches, my breath rasping in my chest. My vision blurs, and my legs feel like they might give way beneath me. I force myself to run, back toward the sunlight that marks the edge of the woods. Walker's shouts and the creature's roars mingle with the frantic thudding of my own heart as I stumble out into the clearing by the house. I don't stop running until I reach the safety of the cruiser. It's only then, slumped against the steering wheel, that I allow myself to acknowledge the burning pain in my chest and the blood soaking through my torn shirt. Backup arrives minutes later. EMTs swarm around me, a blur of concerned faces and urgent voices. Sirens wail in the distance, but the sound feels far away. It's over. I'm alive, somehow. They patch me up at the hospital. The wounds on my chest are deep, but miraculously, nothing vital was hit. My head is a mess of scrapes, bruises, and a mild concussion. The doctor warns me about the risk of infection and tells me I'm a damn lucky man. It's a sentiment almost everyone in Elkin County would echo in the coming weeks. News of the attack spreads like wildfire. The small town quaint image of Elkin County is shattered. My story, disjointed, unbelievable, and utterly chilling becomes local legend. Some call me a hero. Others whisper that I must have done something to provoke the creature that I brought the darkness into our peaceful little world. Mrs. Watkins and Tommy Parker are never found. Search parties scour the forest for weeks but turn up nothing. No remains, no trace. It's like they simply vanished into thin air. After a few weeks of mandatory leave, I return to work. Walking back into the station feels both terrifying and oddly comforting. There's a newfound respect in my colleagues' eyes tinged with a touch of wary disbelief. But there's also a sense of camaraderie, a shared understanding that we all brush up against things we can't explain. The first few patrols are a blur of adrenaline and hyper-awareness. Every rustle of leaves, every snapped branch, makes me jump, pistol drawn and ready. My sleep is racked by nightmares, flashes of yellow eyes, the stench of rotting meat, the suffocating weight of the creature on my chest. Walker and I are inseparable on shifts. We check on each other constantly, a silent pact forged in the darkness of that forest. He's the only one who truly understands what I saw, what I faced. I catch him staring into the trees sometimes, a furrow in his brow. And I know he's seeing the creature too. Fear becomes a permanent resident in Elkin County. People walk in groups, never venture near the forest edge after dark. Gun sails skyrocket, the once sleepy town adopting the air of a fortress under siege. Every night I lie awake, my wife clutching my hand a little tighter, listening to the rustle of wind through the trees and praying the yellow eyes don't appear in the darkness. The creature becomes an obsession. There are whispers, sightings claimed by overzealous hunters and scared hikers. I try to follow up on any credible report but they always lead to dead ends. It's like the woods themselves are protecting it. Months pass, turning into a numb kind of routine. The town's new normal, the never fully extinguished fear, settles like a fine layer of dust over everything. Then, one chilly autumn morning, a call crackles over the radio that sends my blood cold. A young couple, out camping deep in the woods, stumbled into the station disheveled and terrified. They describe the creature, the very same monstrous thing that haunts my nightmares. They talk of a ruined campsite, a blood trail leading into the trees, and their missing friend. My stomach churns. We're about to do this all again. This time, I'm not alone. A whole team assembles, armed to the teeth and grim-faced. Walker's at my side, his jaw clenched. The forest feels different today heavy with a sense of terrible anticipation. We find the campsite easily enough. It's a scene of brutal chaos, ripped tents, scattered supplies, and far too much blood. We follow the blood trail, fear and determination propelling us forward. Deeper into the woods we go, 
the sunlight barely filtering through the thick canopy overhead. And then, up ahead, I see a flicker of movement, a massive shape disappearing behind a cluster of moss-covered boulders. We exchange grim glances. This is it. We spread out, forming a cautious perimeter around the rocks. I motion for the team to hold their position, my pulse a frantic drumbeat in my ears. Slowly, weapon raised, I step out from behind a tree. The creature is facing away from me, hunched over a body sprawled on the ground. I recognize the tattered remains of the missing camper's hiking jacket. My vision tunnels, rage fueling a reckless surge of courage. Hey! I roar, my voice echoing through the clearing. Every muscle in my body is coiled tight, ready for the attack. It spins around, the movement shockingly fast for something so massive. The dead camper's blood drips from its massive jaws, its yellow eyes blazing with fury. It takes a menacing step toward me. Fire! I yell, squeezing the trigger. The clearing erupts in a cacophony of gunfire. The creature roars in pain and staggers back, but it keeps coming. I empty my pistol, the recoil jarring my injured shoulder. I can hear Walker shouting beside me, a desperate litany of curses and gunfire. Just when I think it won't stop, when those terrible claws are about to close around me, the creature falters. It stumbles, its monstrous form shuddering. Then, with a final earth-shaking roar, it collapses to the ground, its massive body crushing the undergrowth. Silence descends, broken only by our ragged breathing. We stand frozen, staring at the lifeless beast. It's finally over. The aftermath is a blur. The creature's body is taken away, studied by God knows who. News outlets descend on Elkin County once again. There are whispers of cover-ups, of secret experiments gone wrong. I become a minor celebrity, the cop who survived the monster, the cop who killed it. But all I feel is a bone-deep weariness. I see the creature's dead eyes in my dreams, but the terror is lessened. I did what I had to do, and somehow, I'm still here. Elkin County slowly returns to a semblance of normalcy. The fear doesn't fully disappear. The awareness of the darkness lurking at the edge of the woods lingers. But life resumes. I even start taking the occasional solo patrol, needing the quiet to process the impossible things I've endured. One year after the final encounter, on a warm summer night, I find myself driving near Mrs. Watkins' place. A flicker of movement at the wood's edge catches my attention. I pull over, a familiar mix of dread and curiosity washing over me. Stepping out of the cruiser, I cautiously approach the tree line, flashlight beam cutting through the night. And there, nestled in the dappled moonlight beneath an oak tree, is a sight that makes me catch my breath. It's a wolf, massive and silver-furred, with eyes that gleam an almost familiar yellow. It observes me, head tilted, an uncanny intelligence in its gaze. Then, with an almost graceful turn, it melts back into the shadows, leaving me standing alone at the edge of the wild, unknowable world that surrounds our little town. In the weeks and months after the attack, I withdraw. The adrenaline crash leaves me hollowed out, exhausted. Nightmares plague my sleep a constant reel of snapping jaws and yellow eyes. The weight of Tommy Parker and Mrs. Watkins' disappearance rests heavy on my conscience. Even though the physical wounds heal, there's a ragged hole in my soul. The small-town peace, the easy trust I'd once taken for granted, feels shattered. The forest, my childhood playground, now seems hostile, a place where ancient terrors lurk. I try to keep working. The forced normalcy, the familiar weight of the uniform, provides a tenuous comfort. But I'm jumpy. My reflexes hair-trigger tight. Each patrol feels like stepping onto a minefield, the air thick with unseen danger. My marriage buckles under the strain. Beth, bless her heart, tries to be understanding, but she can't comprehend the thing I faced, the fear that lives in my bones now. Even my kids, with their innocent laughter and silly cartoons, 
feel strangely distant, a reminder of the normalcy I can no longer claim. Walker sees it. One night, after a particularly rough shift, he corners me outside the station. Hayes, he says, his voice low. You're not right. I bristle at first, defensive, but something in his eyes, understanding, not judgment, makes me deflate. You got any better ideas? I mumble, the weight of the last few months crushing down on me. He offers me a ride home, and in the cramped interior of his patrol car, we talk. It pours out of me, the fear, the guilt, the relentless nightmares. I leave nothing unsaid, spilling the darkness that's been eating away at me. Walker just listens. When I'm finally finished, hoarse and shaking, he extends a dented flask. Take a swig. Might help calm those nerves. I hesitate, then take it gratefully. The whiskey burns a fiery path down my throat, but brings a welcome numbness. That night marks a turning point. Not a good one, mind you, just different. Walker becomes my lifeline, the only one who truly gets it. Late patrols turn into blurry-edged nights at the lone dive bar in town, sharing stories, swilling cheap booze, and finding a kind of twisted solace in shared trauma. Beth tries to intervene at first, pleads with me to get help, to fight this. But I just feel numb, hollow inside. Sleep remains elusive, and the whiskey is the only way to numb the nightmares, to silence the creature's roars. One day... I find a notice slipped under my windshield wiper. Suspension without pay. Pending mental health evaluation. My badge, the symbol of the life I used to have, sits heavily in my palm on the drive home. When I walk through the door, Beth meets my eyes and there's a mix of sadness and relief in her gaze. It breaks something in me. The evaluation is a farce. A bored-looking psychiatrist scribbles notes as I recount the incident. The crushing aftermath. I can see it on his face. He thinks I'm crazy, or lying, or both. They deem me unfit for duty, a danger to myself and others. I don't even fight it. The days stretch into a formless blur. I drift, a ghost in my own life. Beth and the kids hover around me with worried eyes and forced smiles. The unspoken distance grows wider, an impossible chasm I can't seem to bridge. Locals start looking at me differently, too. No more friendly waves. No smiles in the grocery aisle. Some mutter about PTSD. Others about a curse I carried back from the woods that day. My reputation, once solid as the mountains around us, crumbles. The creature becomes a sickeningly familiar tormentor. It lurks in my peripheral vision, a dark shape slinking away when I turn my head. I start hearing it at night. Low growls outside my window, the snapping of branches in the woods behind the house. Beth swears it's just deer, my imagination gone wild. Maybe she's right. One rainy afternoon, I'm alone in the house when a sound jolts me from the whiskey-induced haze. A scratching at the back door, insistent, unlike any animal I know. My heart slams against my ribs. I grab my old service pistol the metal cold and heavy in my trembling hand. Slowly, fighting the terror rising in my throat, I inch open the door. There, on the back patio, sits a wolf. Bigger than any I've ever seen, with silver fur and those haunting yellow eyes. Not the beast, not the monster from the woods, but eerily, uncannily familiar. It regards me steadily. I feel an absurd kinship with the creature, us outsiders bound by a shared experience that no one else can comprehend. Then, without a sound, it turns and vanishes into the trees. That night, I walk out the back door. A part of me knows this is stupid, self-destructive even, but there's a hollow recklessness within me that I can no longer deny. The rain whips against my skin, clearing my head in a way the whiskey no longer can. Beth sees me go but doesn't try to stop me. I think she understands. I walk into the woods. The darkness envelops me, the rain muffling any sound I might make. Still, I move with a hunter's instinct, 
adrenaline cutting through the fog in my veins. Somewhere ahead I know the creature waits, whether to finish what it started or something else entirely I don't know. It hardly seems to matter anymore. The trees give way to a clearing, and there, illuminated by a break in the clouds, it stands. Not the hulking monstrosity of my nightmares, but the silver wolf. Its gaze burns into me, an unspoken invitation, a challenge. And I understand, not with words, but a deeper kind of knowing. This is my path now, the path of the broken, the haunted, a way to live shadowed by the wild, to face the darkness that forever changed me. I take a step forward, then another. Back in 2009, I was working as a ranch hand in West Texas, out near Marfa. It's wide open country out there, full of mesquite and cattle, and more stars at night than a city dweller could imagine. I grew up on the Navajo Nation up in Arizona, so this felt a bit like home, just with a whole different flavor. Named Sosi. The ranch I worked for was big, old school. Owner, Mr. Grady, was a tough son of a gun. Type of guy who expected you to work from before sunrise till well past dark and grumbled if you used more than ten words in a day. I mostly kept my head down and did my chores, but we got along well enough. Anyways, one hot summer afternoon, Mr. Grady comes up to me and says, Sosie, we got ourselves a problem. Coyote got into the goat pen last night, killed one clean. Now, coyotes are common out there, but it was rare for one to get through the fencing Mr. Grady prided himself on. Goats were his wife's pride and joy, so this was serious business. Want you to ride out, check the fences for any weak spots. Might need to set traps as well, he said, squinting up at the sun like it personally offended him. I spent the next few hours on horseback, scanning the barbed wire along the perimeter fence. It was hot, back-breaking work under the unforgiving sun. Found some sections needed mending, but nothing a coyote could easily slip through. As dusk began to settle, I decided to push further out into the scrub, figure out where those coyotes were coming from. The land rolled on and on, mesquite trees casting long shadows like twisted fingers. It was out there, about a mile off the fence line, that I saw the carcass. Not a goat, but a young deer, mangled in a way that screamed predator, but not the usual kind. The thing that unsettled me most was the blood splatter. It wasn't a clean kill. This animal had been ripped apart, almost toyed with. I nudged my horse closer, a bad feeling prickling my skin. That something felt wrong. Suddenly my horse reared, nostrils flared. It took all my strength to keep her under control. That's when I saw it just at the edge of the fading light, watching from a patch of mesquite. Humanoid in shape, but too tall and gangly, like a scarecrow come to life. The head was large and oval, and even from this distance, I could make out two deep gashes where eyes should have been. The skin was stretched tight across its frame, a sickly pale color that reminded me of rotten meat. I froze. Adrenaline sang in my veins. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't natural. Something my granddad might have warned me about back home. Something with an old name I didn't like to say out loud. I kicked my horse and bolted, the creature barely a flicker of movement, as I spurred my ride into a panicked gallop. My mind raced, trying to rationalize what I'd seen, but fear had a hold of me. Back at the ranch... I told Mr. Grady about the dead deer, left out any mention of the creature. He scoffed, grumbled something about me being a superstitious Navajo, but told me to set some extra traps anyways. That night, I had trouble sleeping. It wasn't just seeing the thing, but the way it moved, like it didn't fully belong in this world. In the stillness of the desert, I heard coyotes yipping in the distance, but the sound was off punctuated by strange, almost human-like whimpers. The next morning, disaster. One of the ranch hands, 
young kid named Eli, came running up to the house, white-faced and babbling. He said he went out to the goat pen early and found what was left of one barely recognizable. Mr. Grady and I raced to the pen. The sight that greeted us could only be described as carnage. It wasn't just one goat, but a whole flock slaughtered. Blood was smeared across the walls, the ground, even in splatters high on the roof. That was when Mr. Grady turned to me, his face etched with a fear I'd never seen before. Coyote ain't done this, he rasped. Something else is out there, something unnatural. We organized a search party, me, Mr. Grady, and a few other ranch hands armed with rifles. Spread out, we swept the surrounding land, looking for any sign of the creature. That primal fear gnawed at my guts, mixed with a sense of responsibility. Maybe if I'd told Mr. Grady what I truly saw that first day, we could have been prepared. We searched until the sun dipped below the horizon, found nothing but the vastness of the Texas desert and the silence that echoed with the unspoken fear in our hearts. That night, gathered around a campfire under the open sky, we discussed what to do. Leave? Call the authorities? Set up some sort of fortified pen for the remaining goats? None of the options felt right. Felt like they would make any difference against the kind of thing we were facing. Just when the hopelessness was settling in, old Mrs. Grady came out of the house, her face illuminated by the firelight. She looked at each of us, her gaze steely. What you saw, what you're fearing. It's got a name my great-granny spoke of, Skinwalker. Mrs. Grady's word hung in the heavy air between us. I heard the stories as a child, she went on. Thought they were nothing more than myths to scare us into behaving. Now... Her voice trailed off, and she looked over at the empty goat pen her eyes shadowed by the campfire glow. Something stirred in me. A memory back home, listening to my grandfather tell a story by firelight about a creature so dark, its name wasn't to be uttered aloud. A Navajo witch, some might say, filled with so much hatred they transformed into something monstrous. I had dismissed them as mere folk tales, but here... They say a skinwalker can't be killed by ordinary means. Mrs. Grady continued. You'll need something, something special, silver or a ritual, something from where it draws its power. Mr. Grady looked skeptical, but a new determination was growing in me. I wasn't going to let this thing, this skinwalker, terrorize us anymore. Whatever it took, whatever sliver of my heritage I could recall, I'd find a way to stop it. Days turned into a blur, Sleepless nights filled with the haunting image of that creature and the echoes of coyotes howling in the distance. We buried the slaughtered goats, the task grim and heavy. The air thrummed with tension, each rustle of wind and creak of the house sending shivers down our spines. From what Mrs. Grady could remember, and from what I could piece together from my own fading childhood memories, we made a plan. It was a desperate, long-shot gamble drawing the creature out and luring it into a trap. We fortified a small shed, reinforcing the walls and windows with whatever scrap metal we could find. Inside, we laid a trail of goat blood, leading to a carefully constructed makeshift cage built from old fence posts and heavy netting. And at the center of it all, a silver bullet. A single shot, if we were lucky. I volunteered as bait. The others tried to argue, but my mind was set. If that bullet was the only way to kill the skinwalker, it needed to be lured close enough for me to aim true. The night we set the trap, the air crackled with nervous energy. After rigging up trip wires for alarm and a single floodlight to illuminate the shed, the others retreated to the house. I stayed outside, hidden near the shed, my rifle loaded and my heart drumming like a rabbit against my ribs. The moon hung fat in the sky, a cold companion. Hours stretched into an eternity. My muscles cramped and my vision blurred from staring into the shadowy expanse. Just when doubt began to gnaw at me, I heard it. 
the faintest snap of a twig underfoot. I held my breath. Slowly the creature emerged from the darkness. Its grotesque form made my skin crawl, but I steadied my aim. It moved with a jerky, unnatural grace, drawn by the scent of blood. It stepped onto the tripwire with a soft click. The floodlight blared on, briefly blinding the creature. It shrieked, a raspy, inhuman sound that sent chills down my spine. I fired, aiming for its center mass. The shot echoed across the night. It recoiled, a strange, gurgling sound rising from its throat. But it didn't fall. Screeching in a rage, it tore at the netting of the cage. The makeshift structure held, but barely. I fired again and again, trying to keep it at bay. The others rushed out of the house, shouting and firing their own rifles, the chaos reaching a fever pitch. The skinwalker seemed momentarily disoriented by the onslaught. Then, with a last guttural scream, it turned and vanished into the darkness, leaping away with inhuman speed. Silence fell like a shroud. We cautiously followed the blood trail, but it disappeared into the scrub, leaving no trace of our enemy. The next morning, we found more dead goats, this time nearer the house. A grim reminder that the skinwalker was still out there, likely wounded, but far from defeated. The fear that had settled on the ranch deepened. Every shadow, every rustle of leaves, felt like a possible attack. And then came the turning point. As I was patching up the fence line, stumbled upon a hidden hollow under a mesquite bush. Inside was a tangle of animal bones, rotting cloth, and the unmistakable metallic glint of silver. Jewelry, mostly, the kind you'd find at flea markets or pawn shops. But among it was the deformed silver bullet I'd fired at the skinwalker. That's when the truth hit me a revelation so chilling it made me shudder. The Skinwalker wasn't some ancient evil, some supernatural being from Navajo myth. It was human, someone driven by such darkness and hate that they'd become monstrous. The proof was right there in that grotesque collection of trophies. The realization made me sick to the stomach, but also filled me with a new resolve. We weren't dealing with a supernatural beast, but a flesh-and-blood killer. Twisted and dangerous, yes, but a killer all the same. With renewed determination, we laid another trap, this time with bait none of us could stomach. It was a test, a gamble that might confirm the terrible truth. Two agonizing nights later, the trap was sprung, and the floodlight revealed our catch. Not the skinwalker, but a figure writhing in the net. When we dragged the man out of the shed, into the harsh light of the morning, I recognized him. He was a drifter, had passed through town a few weeks back. An angry-looking man, with eyes that seemed to hold a burning coal of hatred. In the end, the truth was both simpler and far more horrifying than we could have imagined. The aftermath was bitter. The truth of the skinwalker, the realization that human cruelty could reach such monstrous heights hung over us like a dark cloud. Some left the ranch, unable to shake the fear. Others, like myself and the Grady's, stayed. We healed as best we could, the land slowly working its way into our bones, bringing a sort of hardened peace. The memory of that summer, of the creature in the night, never leaves me. It's a reminder that monsters aren't always born, sometimes they're made. I live an adventurous life. Well, for an accountant, that is. I'm Randall. You see, I bought my RV, affectionately named Bertha, a couple years back, packed up my desk job and hit the road. It's the only way to get a break from crunching numbers, you know. That sweet, sweet spreadsheet silence. Today, I found myself tucked away in the remote wilds of Washington State. I was a little further out than normal. Usually I try to stick within a few miles of civilization, just in case. But the views, man. The views were worth it. 
Giant trees, so big and old they made me feel truly insignificant. Yeah, a welcome kind of insignificant, considering the usual stuff that fills my head. Anyway, there's this clearing with a little stream running through it. The perfect place to park Bertha. First day, as always, was about setting up camp. Unpacking chairs, finding a good log to sit and enjoy my usual celebratory drink. A few shots of bourbon. This time, though, I noticed something was off as the shadows lengthened. Not a weird sound or anything definable, just a prickly feeling on the back of my neck. I brushed it off. Nerves, probably, being out here further than usual. Next morning, my hike was invigorating. Found a sweet little waterfall, even did some sketching. I'm no artist, but it's a nice way to relax. By the time I got back, it was around dusk. I settled in with a can of beans for dinner and noticed, damn, my camp chair was gone. Just gone. I searched high and low, thinking maybe I'd spaced and brought it along on the hike, but no luck. Had my mind started playing tricks on me already? Things really took a turn for the strange the next day. Woke up to rustling outside the RV. I bolted to a window and saw a figure hunched over my campfire. Just a glimpse before they vanished back into the trees. I hesitated, unsure what to do. Was it a hiker passing through, or someone who knew I was out here alone? I couldn't shake the feeling, so I decided to play it safe. Quickly packed up my stuff, fired up Bertha, and moved down the road about five miles. Found a new, less isolated spot. Figured if it was just a passerby, they wouldn't follow. Now, normally I'd be annoyed to change my plans, but honestly, I was a little relieved to be someplace more open. The new spot had a breathtaking view of the valley, and I decided to set up a hammock between two trees to do some reading. That's when things got really weird. Mid-afternoon, as I was swaying back and forth, I heard what sounded like footsteps crunching through leaves below. I froze. Slowly, I peered over the edge of the hammock to see... Well, someone had taken my damn camp chair again. It was propped up against a tree, plain as day. Now look, I'm not a superstitious guy, but something about this just felt... wrong. I started thinking about how isolated I was up here, and it seriously gave me the creeps. Now remember, this is Randall, the accountant, talking... I don't exactly have the physique to face off against anyone, especially this far out in the wilderness. My only real plan was to drive. So I swung myself out of the hammock, bolted to the RV, tossed my backpack inside, and took off. I kept a nervous eye on the rearview mirror the whole way. I had to get somewhere populated, some small town, a ranger station, whatever. Problem was, the further I drove, the more the roads narrowed, the deeper I went into the woods. After about an hour, the signal on my cell phone died completely. No service bars, nothing. I started getting worried. But I figured the best bet was to just keep going, right? Find someone, get help, sort this thing out. That's when the worst happened. Up ahead, a tree had fallen right across the road. Thick trunk, tangled branches. No way I was getting Bertha through. Shit, shit, shit. What else could I do? I whipped the RV around, headed back the way I had come. I was practically holding my breath, waiting for something to come tearing out of those woods. Every rustle of leaves, every crack of a branch made me jump. I drove like my life depended on it, and eventually I hit a wider road than a highway. It felt like hours before I found a gas station. The sight of other people a mini-mart stocked with junk food dot 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 IT felt like coming back from the dead. Shaky hands fumbled to refill Bertha's tank, and I finally let out a breath I didn't know I'd been holding. Now here's the thing. There are people out there in the woods. Sure, some live off the grid, others may stumble into remote spots, but finding my chair twice in two secluded locations, miles apart, with no sign of anyone... Let's just say I'm not the type who believes in coincidences. 
The moment Bertha was topped off, I took off again. I booked a motel in the nearest town, a place with a chain restaurant next door, and a whole lot of bright lights. Once safe in that generic little room, I called the police. They were nice, but what could they do? Remote location, no proof of anything. Just my word that some weirdo was maybe, possibly messing with me. They took a report, said they'd keep an eye out, but I knew nothing would come of it. I didn't head back to that campsite. Couldn't do it. Instead, I decided to push my trip further south. Warmer temperatures. Fewer damn trees. That sounded pretty good right about now. It's been a week since then, and I haven't seen my camp chair again. I mean, who knows what kind of sick game this is, right? Maybe someone was watching me out there. Figured they could creep me out enough that I'd leave the area. Maybe it worked. Either way, I'm starting to wonder if I haven't traded crunching numbers in a cubicle for a new kind of madness. All alone on the road. And whoever was out there in the woods. Well, I keep catching glimpses of my own shadow, imagining it's someone else. I double-check the locks on Bertha every night, jump at any sound. It's got me twisted in knots, I'll tell you. The other day, I was driving, and I passed a hitchhiker. Young guy, scruffy, with a sign that just said West. Part of me wanted to pull over to have another person nearby, but I didn't. I just drove past. Couldn't bring myself to risk it. I mean, what if he was connected to the hitchhiker? That thought sent ice down my spine. Maybe he was waiting on the side of the road for me, for his partner to bring me to him. And who knows how many others there could be. They could be anywhere. I could be driving straight into a trap. The paranoia only got worse from there. It felt like eyes were on me everywhere. I'd pull into a gas station and imagine the cashier had a glint in their eye like they knew my secret. I kept the curtains on Bertha drawn, and every night I woke up in a cold sweat, heart pounding. Had I heard something? Had someone moved outside? This wore me down. Within a few days, I was a mess. Forget sleeping. Every meal was choked down. Driving. That's all I seemed to do. No destination, no plans. Just running. Running from what, though? From who? I started to doubt myself. Had I imagined it all? Maybe those woods just got into my head. But if the chair thing was real, well, who could be capable of something like that? It was a question I didn't like. See, I knew the type of guy who could pull that off. I've processed enough spreadsheets in my time to know the criminal mind a bit. Those guys, they operate on a whole different level. You think you can predict their moves, but they're just... unpredictable. They enjoy the game, messing with people. And what better game than some lone traveler out on the road? Perfect target. That's when it hit me. That's why I felt uneasy about Bertha. The RV was like a giant label saying, Tourist alone here. I had to get rid of her. But how? Couldn't exactly sell a vehicle without paperwork, and the police would want to know more than what I was comfortable sharing. I needed to think. Then, a billboard caught my eye. Rusty's Junkyard. We buy Rex. Cash paid. It wasn't much of a plan, but it was something. I headed towards the address, hoping Rusty wasn't too discerning about car conditions. The junkyard was out in the middle of nowhere. Stacks of crushed cars, the smell of rust and gasoline hanging heavy in the air. A guy poked his head out of a trailer marked office. Greasy overalls, tattoos crawling up his neck. I swallowed hard. Turns out Rusty couldn't care less about Bertha's condition tossed me a few crisp bills and had one of his guys hook her up and drag her off. There was a flicker of guilt as I watched her go, my home for the past few years, but it faded quickly. I didn't look back as I walked away with the wad of cash in my pocket. That money got me a cheap little sedan, nothing special. Blends right in with the highway traffic. I ditched most of my camping gear, kept just the bare essentials. I figured, 
Less stuff means easier getaway, if needed. Slept in cheap motels, cash only. Changed routes on a whim, took back roads. Felt like a damn fugitive. Weeks went by. Eventually, something started to shift. The world around me didn't feel laced with menace anymore. Sleep came easier, not in one anxious stretch, but broken up throughout the night. I guess that was an improvement. Then, one day, I was driving down a desert highway, sun beating down, nothing but flat scrubland for miles on either side. An old pickup truck chugged past in the opposite direction, and I did a double take. There was something familiar about it, a dent on the passenger side, some faded stickers on the rear window. It was my camp chair, strapped in the truck bed, bouncing along like it didn't have a care in the world. My first thought was to turn around, follow it. But then, would that do any good? What would I even say? What could I even prove? And if there were more of them out there? I shuddered. No point in inviting trouble back in. I kept my eyes trained on the pickup until it dwindled to a speck and vanished. Then, I gripped the steering wheel and forced myself to keep driving forward. There's a world of difference between suspicion and proof. The law wouldn't do anything, and confronting him, well, the type of guy capable of mind games out in the woods, he's not exactly the reasonable sort. Besides, he's got what he wants, right? I'm out of his territory. Maybe he even left Washington State entirely after I bolted. He won his little game. All I can do is try to make sure he doesn't win again. The open road beckons, but it feels different now. There's a shadow over it, and maybe that'll never fully go away. I just have to keep reminding myself, eyes forward, watch the road, and never, ever stop. My name is Will Atwater, and this happened to me in early September of 2011. I was still pretty green with the team back then, full of piss and vinegar. Figured if the legends and old wives' tales were even half true, a fella could make a name for himself out in these woods. Yeah, I was an idiot. Thing is, I've always been more of a city boy. Don't get me wrong, I love a good hike, the smell of pine needles and all that but there's something about the quiet out in the real wild places that gets under a guy's skin. Used to be. The worst thing I worried about was a bear with an empty stomach. Those, at least, you can see coming. This whole ordeal started because of some missing persons reports. Small town tucked up in the Appalachians. Harmony Falls, West Virginia. Seemed routine enough. Three hikers vanished over a couple of months all within the Blackwater Mountain State Forest. The locals were getting the jitters, and the higher-ups figured sending us in would reassure people, even if we didn't turn up a damn thing. Our crew was the usual. Myself, Riley, a resident wilderness expert, Dr. Hayes, the brains of the outfit, and Carter, our team leader and all-around hard-ass. We set up base camp in a meadow just off the main trailhead, the kind of place picture-perfect enough to lull you into a false sense of security. The first few days were all drudgery, searching grid patterns through the thick underbrush, interviewing folks in town who didn't have much to add, and trying not to swat ourselves senseless from the swarms of mosquitoes. Then came the night that changed everything. I was pulling radio watch, half-dozing in the battered old RV that served as our mobile command center, when static crackled from the speaker. Base camp? This is Riley. Over. His voice was tight, a thread of tension cutting through. I jolted upright, fumbling for the transmit button. Riley? This is Will. What's your status? A pause, then. We got something. Tracks. Not human. Big. Come quick and bring back up. He rattled off coordinates and my heart started hammering a double-time rhythm. Grabbing my gear, I woke up Carter and Hayes. Hayes looked worried, that nervous tick starting up by her eye. Carter just grunted and set his jaw, 
the look of a man who'd been waiting for this moment his whole career. We reached Riley less than 15 minutes later, flashlights cutting through the pre-dawn gloom. He stood at the edge of a clearing, rifle at the ready. Over there, he whispered, gesturing to the tree line. That's when I saw the footprints. They were massive, at least 18 inches long even on the soft mud, with what looked like claw marks gouged into the earth. Whatever made them walked on two legs, but this was no bear track, no mountain lion. My mouth went dry. Carter crouched down, studying the imprint. Never seen anything like it, he muttered. Riley motioned for us to follow, and we moved into the trees, single file. The forest floor was a mess of broken branches and overturned leaves. Something big and powerful had passed through here and not long ago. The smell hit us first, a coppery tang of blood mixed with something rotten, like meat left out in the sun too long. Then we came across the deer carcass, or what was left of it. The thing had been ripped apart, bones shattered and strewn about like a kid's discarded toys. Hayes bent down, retching a little into the underbrush. Jesus, was all she managed. Carter swore and there was a hint of fear in his eyes that I'd never seen before. Riley, he barked. Eyes up. This thing could still be close. We moved deeper into the woods, the silence oppressive. The first rays of dawn painted the canopy in streaks of pale gold, but the forest floor remained cloaked in shadow. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, had my nerves jangling. Then I saw it. At first, it was just a flicker of movement in my peripheral vision. Then a hunched shape, taller than any man, disappearing behind a tangle of oak trees. My blood ran cold. There, I hissed, pointing. The others whipped around, weapons raised. We crept forward, muscles taut. Rounding a bend, I caught sight of it again, just for a second. It was massive, at least seven feet tall, covered in coarse, dark fur. Powerful, corded muscles rippled beneath its skin as it moved with unnatural speed, vanishing into the foliage. Its eyes, I only saw them for an instant as it turned its head, glowed a fiery yellow. What the hell was that? Hayes breathed, her voice shaking. I don't know. Carter said, his voice grim, but I intend to find out. We pressed forward, the creature's trail becoming more obvious. Here, a strange, half-eaten animal carcass that looked like a mangled dog. There, a swath of flattened vegetation where something heavy had crashed through the forest. The air hummed with an electric tension I couldn't place. Suddenly, Riley stumbled. We froze, every sense on high alert. His flashlight beam swept the ground, illuminating a thick smear of crimson across the leaves. Blood, he whispered. More worry etched itself onto Hayes's face. The blood trail led us deeper into the heart of the forest. The trees grew thicker, the canopy denser, sunlight barely filtering through. We came upon a small ravine, shrouded in an almost perpetual twilight, and that's when we found the bodies. The first one was strung up in the branches of a tree, clothes torn and shredded, flesh gouged and broken. One of the missing hikers I realized with a jolt of horror. Further into the ravine we found the other two, their bodies desecrated with the same gruesome brutality. Hayes vomited onto the ground, her face pale. I fought the urge to do the same. Whatever we were dealing with, it wasn't just some oversized animal. This was calculated cruel. Carter surveyed the scene, his lips a thin line. We need to get the hell out of here. Now! His order hung heavy in the air. This wasn't supposed to happen. We were the hunters, not the hunted. But as we turned back, a low growl echoed through the ravine, sending chills racing down my spine. The creature stepped out from the shadows, its form a silhouette against the dim light. Up close, it was even more monstrous than I imagined. Its body was a grotesque mix of human and animal. Powerful, ape-like arms hung low, hands tipped with razor-sharp claws. The legs looked almost canine, 
bent strangely at the joints, ending in clawed feet. Its torso was vaguely human, but the hunched posture and unnaturally long neck gave it an unsettling, alien appearance. The head? That's what stuck with me the most. Too wide, too long, with a jaw that jutted out at an impossible angle, filled with rows of jagged teeth. And those eyes, burning like embers in the gloom, devoid of anything resembling human intelligence. It studied us, its head cocking from side to side, a predator assessing its prey. Easy, easy, Carter muttered, his rifle slowly rising. The creature let out another growl, deeper this time, and took a menacing step forward. Fire, Carter roared, and the air filled with the crack of gunshots. The creature screeched, a high-pitched piercing sound that set my teeth on edge. It stumbled backward, bullets tearing into its flesh, but it didn't go down. Blood spattered the forest floor, staining the leaves black. An acrid stench filled the air. The creature snarled, swiping at the air with its claws, fury etched on its monstrous face. Reload! Hayes screamed, her voice tight with terror. We scrambled, fumbling for fresh magazines. Riley jammed a clip into his weapon, and another volley of gunfire rang out. The creature howled, stumbling again. But still, it didn't fall. It lurched forward, a blur of tattered fur and rage. Riley got off one more shot before a massive, clawed hand swept across his chest. I heard his scream, a ragged gasp cut short. He went down in a spray of blood, his body crumpling to the ground. The creature loomed over him, its jaws widening. Riley! Carter yelled, his voice filled with fury and despair. That's when it hit me. There was a primal understanding behind those glowing eyes. This wasn't just some animal attack. It was calculated, sadistic. The creature ripped into Riley's body, a spray of crimson arcing through the air. The screams. I'll never be able to forget the sounds. Carter was firing, a desperate attempt to distract it. Hayes grabbed my arm, pulling me back. We have to go, she cried. Blind panic propelled me. I ran, heart pounding so hard I thought it would burst from my chest. Hayes stumbled beside me, gasping for breath. Behind us, the creature's roars echoed through the trees, mingled with the fading crackle of Carter's gunshots. We burst out of the ravine, scrambling up the steep embankment. I didn't dare look back. We ran through the dense forest, branches whipping at our faces, thorns tearing at our clothes. I don't know how long we ran. Time lost all meaning. Lungs burning, legs screaming. We finally collapsed in a hidden clearing. I lay there, gasping for air, the forest floor beneath me spinning. Hayes sobbed quietly, her body trembling. I couldn't bring myself to say anything. What could I say? Riley was gone. Carter. Chances were, he was gone too. And that thing was still out there. After what felt like an eternity, Hayes forced herself to sit up. We need to radio for help, she said, voice hoarse. Her words jarred me out of my numb haze. A desperate hope flickered within me. Yes, help. We needed backup. We needed... Then I remembered. They couldn't help us. No one could. Hayes reached for the radio at her hip. I put a hand out to stop her. What are you doing? she asked, confusion in her eyes. I took a shaky breath. They can't know about this. They can't know it's real. Hayes stared at me, comprehension dawning in her eyes. The cover-up, she whispered. The government, our employers, knew things existed out here, creatures from nightmares, but they couldn't let that knowledge become public. Panic, chaos, the whole world would unravel. I nodded grimly. We'll say it was a bear attack. Wild animal. It'll be written off as another tragedy. Hayes shuddered, but she understood. It was the only way. It was the lie we had to live with. We stumbled back towards our base camp, weaving a story of panic, confusion, 
and the relentless power of nature. They'd send in a search party, find what was left of Riley and Carter, and the case would be closed. The creature would fade back into the shadows, another whispered tale told around campfires. When we reached base camp, it was already swarming with activity. Cleanup crews in unmarked uniforms descended, their faces devoid of emotion. They'd sanitize the scene, erase any trace of what truly transpired. Hayes and I were whisked away, debriefed in a sterile windowless room. Standard amnesia protocol, they called it, though I doubt they could wipe the images from my mind. In the aftermath, I left the unit. Couldn't bear the thought of hunting monsters, only to be hunted myself. Drifted for a while, trying to find a semblance of normalcy. But normalcy was a luxury I could no longer afford. The world wasn't what I thought it was. There were things lurking on the fringes of our reality, hidden in plain sight. And sometimes, on sleepless nights, I feel them watching me. I tell myself it's paranoia, PTSD from that day in the woods. But deep down, I know the truth. The creature from Blackwater Mountain. It's still out there. And maybe, just maybe, it isn't the only one. The summer of 2008 found me in the rugged badlands of North Dakota. Name's Jasper. I grew up on the Standing Rock Reservation, and after a stint in the Marines, I found myself back in the Dakotas, working for the tribal police. This land, it's harsh, beautiful, and holds more secrets than any outsider could ever understand. This particular summer was a hot one, the kind where the sun beats down and the wind carries the dry scent of sagebrush. Routine calls were the norm. Drunks passed out on the side of the road, petty disputes, and the occasional missing cow or sheep, until the call about the body. It was found by a rancher out near the Little Missouri River, snagged on a half-submerged tree at a bend in the water. The sun had done its work. The body was bloated, the skin peeling. Not a pretty sight. We took photos documented the scene the best we could. Buzzards circled overhead, waiting their turn. I pulled the body from the water. It was a man, a tribal member I recognized, and tangled in his limbs was a fishing net. Officially, the coroner attributed it to accidental drowning. Got caught while fishing alone, dragged downstream by the current. Simple, tragic, the kind of thing that happened on the reservation far too often but that night I couldn't sleep. I kept seeing the look in his eyes, wide open, staring up at the sky, like he'd seen something just before he died. The next day they found another body, this time in the brush further upstream. A young woman, member of the tribe. Her face had a similar look of terror, and her limbs were tangled in the same fishing net. The coroner ruled it another drowning. The body swept downstream and caught at the same spot. But on the reservation, the whispers started. Bad water spirit. River monster. Something dark and ancient lurking beneath the surface. My partner, a no-nonsense woman named Winona, scoffed at the rumors. People are grasping at straws, she'd say, flipping through the case files. We got a couple of accidental deaths. Nothing more. I wasn't so sure. I knew these lands, the old stories. There were whispers of things that lived in the remote lakes and rivers, remnants of a time before the dams and the tourists came, things that weren't always friendly to humans. I volunteered for the night patrols, telling Winona I owed the family's vigilance. Truth was, I wanted to see the river in the moonlight. The first few nights were uneventful. The little Missouri River flowed dark and quiet. Just the croaking of frogs, the chirp of crickets, and the rustling cottonwood leaves whispering overhead. Then came the fourth night. A full moon hung heavy in the sky, throwing a shimmering path across the water. It was eerily beautiful, and my skin prickled with unease. I heard the scream first. A high-pitched shriek 
that seemed to echo off the surrounding bluffs. Then I saw them, two figures thrashing in the river about fifty yards upstream. They were only visible in silhouette against the glowing path of moonlight. Instinct kicked in. I ran. As I drew closer, I saw one figure was bigger, bulkier. It thrashed against the river's current, dragging the other figure down. I reached the riverbank just as both figures were pulled under and vanished. Didn't even see a splash, just a ripple across the moonlit water, and then nothing. Silence settled back over the river like a shroud. I stood there panting, heart pounding against my ribs. What the hell did I just witness? Was it two more drowning accidents? It didn't seem right, not that fast, not that silent, and the size of that thing. Wading into the water, I reached out a hand but felt only the cold current against my fingertips. There was no trace of a struggle, no sign of what had happened. By the time Winona and Backup arrived, there was nothing to say, nothing to show for it. Over the next week, the tension on the reservation simmered into near panic. The river was declared off-limits. Tribal elders organized prayer ceremonies near the water's edge. Offers of assistance poured in from other tribes. Medicine men, paranormal investigators armed with fancy cameras. You name it. Everyone wanted answers. I patrolled the river on foot, armed to the teeth. Every rustle in the bushes sent a jolt through me. I tried explaining to Winona what I saw, but she put it down to stress and bad lighting. Then, one day, a group of kids found it washed up on the banks downstream. Not a body, but the net. It was torn to shreds, woven strands ripped open as if by something with inhuman strength. And embedded within one of the tears was a claw. A single, curved, wickedly sharp claw the kind belonging to no normal animal that swam those waters. Winona held it up against the sunlight, her brow creasing in a frown. Where in the hell did this come from? She muttered. I told her my theory, about the old legends, the thing in the river, whatever it might be. I told her that this wasn't about drunk, careless people anymore. This was something else, something hungry. Winona didn't scoff this time just looked at me with a new kind of respect, maybe even a hint of fear. The tribal council convened. They argued for days, modern pragmatism clashing with ancient beliefs. Finally, the decision was made, echoing rituals followed by my people for centuries. It was time to hunt the river. We formed a hunting party composed of tribal elders, warriors seasoned by their years on the force, and even a few outsiders drawn in by the whispers of a real-life monster. The elders performed rituals, seeking the guidance of the spirits and asking their permission to disrupt the river's natural balance. We built makeshift rafts to comb the river by day. Divers explored the riverbed, finding nothing but murky water, rocks, and a whole lot of snagged fishing lines. By night, we stationed ourselves along the bank, Winona training a spotlight across the surface as I kept my rifle fixed on any telltale ripple. Days bled into nights. Each rustle of leaves in the twilight set our nerves jangling. But there was no sign of the creature. Doubts crept in. Maybe it was just a freak accident, a cluster of misfortune. Maybe I'd misjudged what I saw in the moonlit water. Maybe the old stories weren't always true. We were on the verge of calling it quits. The elders muttered about the river spirit being angered by our intrusion. Winona started talking about how the lack of evidence was evidence in itself. Then came the eighth night. The spotlight's beam cut through the darkness like a knife. We weren't alone. A hundred feet out, the moonlit water rippled, the shape of something massive lurking just beneath the surface. And then it burst from the depths. It wasn't human. It resembled an enormous catfish, but distorted, monstrous. Its skin was pale and slick, its head bulbous with too many eyes that glinted red in the spotlight's glare. Its gaping maw was big enough to swallow a man whole, lined with rows of needle-like teeth. Chaos erupted. Someone shouted an order and gunfire rang out. The bullets splashed around the creature, 
seemingly doing little to deter it. It lunged at Winona's raft, its claws slicing through the rubberized inflatable like paper. Several tribal warriors leaped into the water, distracting it, giving her time to scramble back to shore. I watched her, hard in my throat, but she moved with the honed instincts of a woman who'd faced down too many predators of the two-legged kind. The creature turned on its attackers, thrashing in the river. I saw a flash of red, and then one of the warriors was dragged under, a strangled cry echoing across the water. The creature surfaced again, the man's lifeless body held tight in its jaws. Winona screamed, her voice a raw mix of fury and grief. It was like a switch flipped inside me. The analytical cop, the voice of reason, faded. There was only the warrior, a deep, bone-level need to protect my people. I aimed my rifle, squeezed the trigger, again and again, each shot landing with a wet, thudding sound. The creature shrieked, a terrible, piercing cry that seemed to shake the very air. It whipped its head back and forth, and I caught a glimpse of the beady red eyes fixed on me. Then it was diving, heading straight for my position on the riverbank. I had just enough time to throw myself backwards before it breached the shore. Claws raked through the earth where I'd stood moments before. Mud splattered my face, the fetid stench of the river almost overpowering the scent of gunpowder. The monster was massive, easily twice as long as my truck, leaving a trail of devastation in its wake as it thrashed against the riverbank. Suddenly, I felt the earth crumble beneath my feet. The monster had dislodged part of the bank, and I was sliding toward the rushing current. I scrambled, reaching out desperately for something to hold on to. My fingers found purchase on a twisted tree root. Then, the tree root snapped. I fell. Icy water enveloped me, sucking me down. My lungs burned, screaming for air, and the muddy waters obscured any trace of the creature or the surface. Kicking frantically, I fought against the disorientation, a primal terror coursing through my veins. Suddenly, something wrapped around my ankle, dragging me further down. My mind flashed to the man I'd seen pulled into the depths days before. The world tilted, stars winking overhead as my head broke the surface. Coughing and choking, I gulped lungfuls of blessed air. I could see the blurry forms of the others on the shoreline. The creature silhouetted against the night sky as it thrashed at the water's edge. Then my makeshift lifeline tightened, yanking me further out into the river. I drew my knife, slicing at the slick, leathery flesh around my ankle. It took several desperate attempts before it sliced free, and I burst towards the surface once more. Strong arms pulled me from the water, Winona's voice shouting hoarsely in my ear as I coughed and sputtered. When I could see straight again, the creature was gone. It vanished back into the river's dark depths, leaving only ripples in the slowly settling mud. The aftermath was a blur. They recovered the bodies, laid them to rest with the proper ceremonies. Grief hung heavy over those days, mixing with exhaustion and lingering fear. In the quiet moments, I found myself drawn to the river's edge. I imagined the creature lurking in the depths, the unblinking red eyes watching me from the shadows. We had a monster, a name the news outlets latched onto, painting a picture of a remote reservation battling something out of their worst nightmares. Outsiders came, the cryptozoologists and the ghost hunters, eager to document what they couldn't understand. But the worst predators, I learned, often wore respectable suits and offered condolences before offering lucrative deals. Land developers, oil tycoons, and even the government expressed their interest in helping us solve our monster problem. Like vultures sniffing blood on the wind, they saw an opportunity. Yet the creature never resurfaced. No more bodies were found. No more mysterious disappearances. Slowly, the outsiders retreated, the frenzy died down, and life on our little slice of the Dakotas fell back into familiar rhythms. But it wasn't the same. Some nights, I still wake up in a cold sweat and think I see ripples in the moonlight. The tribal elders say we drove the Oki off, that's their word for it. 
something that feeds on chaos and suffering. They say it's still out there, biding its time in the forgotten corners of our world. Maybe it's true, maybe not. All I know is sometimes the most terrifying monsters are the ones we don't see, the ones made of greed and ambition, and those ancient, shadowy things that still lurk at the edge of our understanding, just beneath the surface of what we call reality. <laughs>